welcome. This is Criminal Profiler Pat Brown, and I want to give apologies to David Ike and let everybody know, yes, I was involved in the murder of Anne Hayes. I woke up this morning and I I found that I was one of the lizard people. <laughs> oh. oh my gosh. Hello everyone. <laughs> Uh, welcome to Criminal Profiler Pat Brown's Hangout Number Fifty Three, and uh, I got I got this uh, I got this comment and when I put under the Anne Heche, uh video I did from Audrey Rose. Yes, I'll call you out, Audrey Rose, because you're one of the many nutcases out there, and you've got to stop doing this stuff. You need psychological help. Actress that knew too much. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Oh, I, got, I forgot to put it on silent mode and I have some some skin, some kind of crap coming in on my film. Okay, I fixed it. All right. The, uh, Audrey Rose says, actress that knew too much. And then she's like, Paul Walker also was about to expose him. Remember Paul Walker, the gorgeous guy in all the movies? Uh, he drove his car too fast and crashed it, as did N. H. He wasn't under the influence, but he was, you know, he loved to drive fast cars. And he blew it that time. And it was very, very sad. And at the end of this, she also says, Paul Walker, anyone also about to expose people as well as Chris Chornell and Chester Bennington? I don't know who that is. But believe me, the list is long as to who got murdered because they're about to expose them. Worldwide, governmentally backed uh, cabal of child sex trafficking. And then the, ant, the, the bar, bottom part of this is you're just part of the problem, Pat. Because I am a denier of this. Let's see, Andrea. Let's see. Hmm. Hide user from channel. Bye. 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 Okay. So anyway, <laughs> but I did wake up and find out I'm a lizard. Okay. And uh, <laughs> uh, you can see and hear me. Did you see and hear me as a lizard, or do you see and hear me as Pat Brown? Um, and you know, anybody who knows me, uh, especially Anne, Annie Haley, knows I'm an absolute lizard lover. Uh, I am. Uh, iguanas are my favorite lizard. I've, I've had, uh, let's see, two, three iguanas in my lifetime. Um, I had one iguana for uh, 12 years. Uh, Abraham is wonderful. Um, and I've also had Smiley, the, the, um, the uh, dragon. Uh, uh, and, you know, I've had all kinds of lizards over my life because I'm a reptile lover. And so <laughs> yeah, I could be one of the lizard people. <sighs> Oh, so frustrating. So anyway, I want to mention this because I, you know, um, I've gotten a lot of flack over my my commentary on on the man who killed his two children in Mexico, claiming they were lizard people that they had DNA and then that was lizard people. Um, it's the last one of the last videos I did, and I mentioned and I, I said his name wrong. I called him David Ick because I quite frankly never heard of him, and I got nailed by a lot of people. A couple of people just you know just helping me out there. Oh no, it's Ick. Um, and, other people being very, very upset that I called them ick, although I think my pronunciation is more apt. Anyway, um, so I did download one of his books just because, you know, when people say, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, OK, so I downloaded one of his books. It's called The Answer. You know, be, beware of anything that says things like the secret the answer because generally speaking they're not secrets or answers they're just people making a lot of money off of you so i, I downloaded um <laughs> the answer and what a pile of bunker crap did i just try to read um it, it was absolutely nonsensical and let me tell you how this actually works because it's very important because there are a lot of people he, he's making a fortune the dude made making a fortune and he's got a new book coming out don't you know um <laughs> he's going to make more money so David Eek once was a broadcaster and then went off into this land of uh, snake oil salesman. And I'm sorry, I don't believe that he's uh, does, you know, he's just, he's, he went to a psychic and was told basically he was the next Jesus Christ, even though he doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. So he's just the, <laughs> the next one who channels from beyond or from behind from the lizard people. I don't know what he's channeling from, but anyway, what he does, which is what all snake oil salesmen do, and which is what I think is so important for people to understand is that there's there are truths hidden in his complete nonsense 
So you don't start with absolutely nothing. You start with something that has some level of, okay, there's, there's, we can go something with that. Um, because that's how you hook people in. And then what happens once you hook people into some basic concept that could well be true, um, then you add a whole bunch of nonsense that you have no validity for, that you have made up a complete fantasy. And then you get people to go, you know, that could be true too. No, it couldn't. <laughs> That's nonsense. Stop believing nonsense. Um, we don't know everything about where we come from as human beings. We don't know everything about the world. We don't know everything that comes before and after death. We don't. We have religions who try to address these things. And we have scientists who try to address these things. But in re real world thinking, we actually do not actually know everything. And what, what I like in this too is if you're an ant and you're at the bottom of a tree, you can see nothing but the bottom of the tree. You don't know what's above you. So you have no idea of what else there is. But on the other hand, we people above the ground do not see into the, anim the ant world underneath the ground and all the tunnels and all the, the incredible, um, they have a society down there. They have, they have, they have a, a whole structure of how they do things. It's absolutely fascinating. And so, but we don't understand it because we're big people above ground. So there's a lot we do not know about the whole world, about the universe, about before and after. That's okay that we don't know, and it's okay to speculate. It's not okay to tell people this is the answer, this is the truth, this is the secret, and tell people things that are not supported by anything to get them to believe it and act upon it. That is a psychopath who wants that thrill of power and control and making a fortune as well. So, yes, some of what David Eke says has maybe little pieces of validity but his stuff is absolute garbage nonsense. And um, so I, I downloaded this book. I started to read it. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. It was a, a mess, a mess of stupidity. Um, I did return it to Amazon. Uh, and you can do this, by the way, folks, you can download a Kindle. And when you look at it and go, you gotta be, and I'm not paying for this crap. You just hit return and you say, why? And I just put other, cause I can't, they don't have it on the list. Like guys, an idiot that wasn't on the list. So I just put other, hit the button and they return your money. But I wanted to look at it to see, you know, this is his, one of his more recent books. I wanted to see what they're saying, give them a break. You know, maybe there's some truth. No, the dude's a snake oil salesman, a psychopath. Stop paying attention to him. It's just absolute garbage nonsense. And I have no, I'm done. I'm done with being sympathetic toward this kind of nonsense. And hey, she did, was not murdered. She died because she did drugs and alcohol and crashed her vehicle. That's all there is to it. You know, stop, stop it, stop it, stop with the nonsense. It's, if, if you're going to look at something that is questionable, that you think the government is behind, you think there's certain people behind, there's some kind of conspiracy, I'm okay with this. I'm, I'm not one of these people that says, oh, no, 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 everything is always perfect and above board. No, sometimes there are people who get together and do stuff, especially high up in the government. People have a lot of power and control in, in history. There's been a lot of conspiracies. Um, for example, simple one, um, in my book, uh, The Murder of Cleopatra, um, when, when, when Caesar was killed outside of the temple, he was stabbed. Um, actually, was he stabbed in? I can't even remember. <laughs> was he stabbed in or outside? I'm sorry, not the temple. I've lost my mind. I've wrote a book on it and I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> see, <laughs> I wish I had editing. Okay, I wrote a book. Okay. Uh, let me find it. Let me find it. Okay. Where is it? Where the heck is it? My, my book's gone now. Wow. Where did my book disappear? Huh. Okay. I wrote a book. <laughs> it's not on my shelf. Where did it go? Anyway, um, I wrote a book called The Murder of Cleopatra. And, um, and so Caesar was, was stabbed to death. And, and um, Brutus was one that supposedly killed him, ate two Brutus, you know, and outside, outside of where he was stabbed, he was outside, I'm sorry, he was killed inside, outside was Mark Anthony, who was, uh, was chit-chatting with people outside. I strongly believe Mark Anthony was involved in the murder of Caesar, um, and I, and there's a lot of evidence to support that, which I have in my book, which I can't find on my shelf, 
<laughs> the lizard people have taken over my brain. <laughs> Anyway, so, um, but I believe Aunt Mark Anthony was involved in a conspiracy to kill Mark, uh, to kill uh, Caesar because he wanted to take the place of Caesar and Caesar was leaning toward um, Octavian. So are there conspiracies in the world? Yes, there are. And, and they're, they're across the globe in many ways. But please, folks, if you're going to go with a conspiracy theory of some sort, at least have some basic information to support it. Don't go with lizard people. You know, when you start going with lizard people and that you're killing Anne Heche because she's, she's doing a movie. I mean, this is nonsense. And it, it is very, very, um, it's, it's just very destructive. And so it just really, really ticks me off. And I'm done with trying to be nice about it. I'm done with it. Uh, you know, sorry, guys. What you're doing is wrong. And what people who are t saying these things, it's wrong. So don't go there. Come up with some evidence. Don't come up with evidence. Go the hell away. Okay. So anyway, that's my little speech for tonight. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. So um, let's see. I'm going to look back and say hello to everybody in the chat room before I do the hangout. <laughs> I haven't eaten tonight. I just want to let you know that I was about to do, I was about to make my dinner. And mosquitoes are biting me too. This is, this is a rough night. Uh, I was about to make my dinner and then I, I set up my show and the screen was flashing like this so i contacted Streamyard. i'm like hey you know i'm doing a show in 45 minutes and this is a mess so they were wonderful Streamyard is i'm, I'm going to give them a little shout out they're not paying me for this i do all my live streams through Streamyard, and they are the best customer service people i've ever run into they're unbelievably fantastic i immediately contact them they immediately give me real information to fix my camera my my uh, audio uh, what's wrong on the screen? Unbelievable. They fix this too. So, I, you know, it's nice to see an organization be worth the money. And I, StreamYard is fantastic. So that's all I can say. So StreamYard, you know, thank you. Thank you because you made my day. Okay, let me go say hello to everybody and then I'll get to the crime topics. I have to, <laughs> the lizard thing set me off. Sorry. <laughs> the lizard thing sets me off. Oh, um, let's see. Um, Okay, so Lisa S is here. Christine is here. Um, let me see who else is here. Uh, Florence is here. Uh, oh, that's so nice, Christine. Thank you. Best time ever learning with you, Pat, and everyone's feedback. I have a we have a great community here in in um, in the chat room. And if you're interested in being in the chat rooms, uh, all the chat rooms are available for all the hangouts, for the phone ins, and for the Sunday shows that I do on the cases every week. Uh, all you have to do is click below, join Patreon. It's five, five bucks a month. It supports the channel. And I, I try to keep it cheap because I just, I, I, I'm just not good at begging for big sums of money. <laughs> so I just have one, $5, you get everything. There's nothing hidden and you can join the chat rooms. And if you don't want to do that, folks, hey, just, just, just uh, subscribe to the channel like the video, share with your friends, hit the bell for, for uh, you know, what's coming up. And um, you don't have to pay anything, but you do support the channel, and I appreciate that. So let's see who else is here. All right, so also here, let's see. Um, oh, okay, well, no, wait a minute. I want to see what Florence has to say about Ken Maines. What? What? Oh, okay, I, I, I'm going to have to look this up. Oh, my God, really? Florence, Florence says, I just want to mention that Ken Maines, by the way, I really like Ken Maines. I go to his channel. Um, uh, uh, he, he does really good stuff. He's a retired homicide detective. We don't always agree. And we didn't agree on West Memphis 3. But as I point out, we don't always have to agree. I don't like to you know, think that just because we're all quote, experts in our field, that we always have to like, oh, you know, they're wrong on this, so therefore they're worthless. No, no, no. Ken Maines is great. He does really good stuff. And I like to support people who do really good stuff, as opposed to David Eck. No, <laughs> David Eck, who is just a snake oil salesman. Ken Maines is great. And so I'm really shocked about this. So I want to mention that Ken Maines has updated his take on the West Memphis Three and has moved to the middle as to their guilt. Basically neutral now. Wow. Okay. Um, wow. Um, interesting. Ken Maines has always felt the West Memphis Three was uh, was uh, innocent of the crime, 
and now he's in the middle. Okay, that's fascinating. I have come out strongly for years that the West Memphis Three are guilty. Um, I have strongly believed that. You can go to my West Memphis Three video and see what I think about the whole thing. I've analyzed the whole crime. Uh, I, I, you know, it, it's such a contentious thing that, let me tell you something. When you speak up against the grain, so we say against what Hollywood and everybody wants to believe, and you come out and speak strongly, it's like getting your nut cut off, you know? So a lot of people, even experts, are really afraid to say anything that doesn't go with the media narrative. Madeleine McCann, almost every FBI profile says she was kidnapped. I've never, I've always said there's no evidence of abduction. Doesn't make me popular with the media. They won't let me on. Well, I get a few, few, few things, but usually they put me on so they can attack me. Um, and West Memphis 3 is one of those. Um, if you say you think West Memphis 3 is guilty, you get a whole lot of nasty, nasty emails um, and comments, and it, it doesn't make you popular. So sometimes it's easier for experts to go with what's popular, uh, or at least not you know, not cause a problem there. So, you know, so uh, Ken, Ken Maines, I, I, I respect him. I don't think he did. Ken Maines, I don't believe, ever went uh, saying the West Memphis Three were innocent because he was afraid of people's viewpoints. I think Ken Maines is a straight up dude. That's why I like him. Um, if he disagrees with what I say, I think it's because he's analyzed evidence and comes up with a different conclusion. And that's okay with me. Um, I like Ken Maines a lot. So, but I'm really surprised to hear that. I'm going to have to check that out. I'm really kind of shocked. Okay. Um, let me see. All right. Let's see. Oh, well, thank you, Lisa. I'm glad you can see and hear me well. I always ask, uh, well, I used to ask that question every time, but now everybody just tells me they can see and hear me. So that's awesome. Oh, you missed me on. Oh, Lisa wasn't there on Sunday. She was, she had, she had a life outside of YouTube. <laughs> okay. Wait a minute. Oh, um, Wait a minute. So Florence says, originally he came out more in favor of the innocence. Then the other day he put out a revisited tape and said he didn't think there was enough to convict them, but he said he just didn't know. Okay, I respect that. The, the tricky part a lot of times with crimes, I'm going to talk about that in some of the cases today, is that you kind of like, you know, they did it, especially if you've been working as a police detective on the case. But sometimes there is not enough that you feel that maybe a jury, especially a civilian jury, will not find there's enough to convict. So it doesn't mean they didn't do it. It just means you're not sure that you can prove it in a court of law. And, and so, you know, I respect that that point of view as well. So anyway, Mary is here. Hi, Mary. Um, and Lisa S. is here. Christine is here. I, I, I forgot. Florence is here. I'm just trying to go back over to say hello to folks. Annika is here. <laughs> A Minneapolis lizard here. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, Okay, I'm no, I'm okay. Let's see what says. Elisa Ann is here. <laughs> Hi, everyone. A bit late, but love seeing Pat so animated already. It's only because I didn't get my dinner, you know. So I'm like, no, it's and I'm being eaten by. I have no flies. Have you noticed that? I just want to let you know the flies are gone. It, it's weird, um, because you know, there have been a, I've had a fly infestation, and I actually I didn't spray anything, but. In, in um, where I live is right next to cows, right? So somewhere around Jul July and August, we get this huge fly infestation that's crazy. And usually I just put up with it because I'm like, yeah, you know, I had, you know, I, I don't like spraying in my house. But by the end of August, they just vanish. It's weird. And they're gone. Almost all of them are gone. But the mosquitoes are here. <laughs> I'm like, what the? I'm being eaten by mosquitoes. Oh, Ms. Leah is here too. Welcome. Sorry, you're late. You had to feed the kids dinner. You know, Leah, that is kind of what you should do. <laughs> I, I like the joke I heard the other day. It said, you know, I have a real problem with people feeding children frozen dinners. You should at least microwave it before you serve it. <laughs> did you microwave it, Leah? Hmm. Did you microwave it? All right. Let's see. Um, Let's see. Uh, well, Annika says, 
I do like Ken Maines. I wish I agreed with him more, but he's smart. He is smart. And, you know, he comes from, uh, Ken Maines comes from a detective viewpoint. And I, I think he's sticking to what a detective would come up with on the cases. So, you know, I, I, I do. I say I like him very much. I do. Um, okay. So Molly is here as well. All right. All right. So let me get to what I want to talk about. All right. So another kind of the lizard thing. By the way, if you would like to buy this, this is a this is a game. It's a it's called it's a frog game actually. It's not a, it's really a frog, not a lizard. But then you set up these little pieces, and then all the children put this on and knock all the pieces down. I got it for my granddaughter, so that's why I have this in my house. Not that I felt roots with my lizard DNA. <laughs> okay, I want to talk about this Joker. All right. Speaking of people who everybody thinks, well, not everybody, so many people think uh, is or is innocent, is this Stephen, Stephen Avery. Okay, Stephen Avery from uh, Making uh, making a Murderer Nonsense Garbage, written, written by, by the defense attorney and pushed by the Netflix folks who wanted to make a million, and they did. Okay, new evidence, new stuff coming out, not evidence. Stephen Avery's attorney says new and compelling evidence, okay, new and compelling evidence warrants a new trial. How many times has this woman said that? Mm. Okay, let's see. This came in August 16th, so this is just like last week. So the attorney for Stephen Avery has released a third motion for post-conviction relief of his 2007 conviction in the killing of Teresa Halbach in Manitoba County. Kathleen Zellner. Okay, I don't like her. I'm gonna say it. I don't like people who uh, who want to get serial killers out of prison. I'm sorry, I have an issue with that, especially when the massive evidence against this guy. I, I, it makes me. Oh, that's a sign. I'm sorry. I'm using sign language. Throw up. Okay, American sign language. All right. Um, all right. So she's requesting an evidentiary hearing on the basis of two new witnesses. <laughs> where, where did she dig them out of? maybe from underneath the fire pit where her bones were found behind uh, Stephen Avery's house burnt up. Okay. So she has two new witnesses with, let me put the quotes up again, new and compelling evidence about a murder mystery. <laughs> it's not a mystery. So he called Teresa Hallback and said, come over to my house. She disappeared. She ended up dead behind his house. Okay. A murder mystery that has intrigued a worldwide audience. Yeah, because Netflix put really cool music with it and 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 gave the defense theory, which was garbage. But hey, you know, you can sucker people. The case was the subject of Netflix true crime docuseries, Making a Murderer. Making a Murderer, sorry. Zellner claims that the witnesses can provide, and the quotes come in all the time, new and un. New and undisputed, undisputed evidence that directly links a third party, <laughs> a third party suspect to the murder of Teresa Halbach and framing of Avery. So someone, let me get this straight. So someone said, oh my God, you know, Stephen just called somehow. Oh my God. How did they know this? How did they know Stephen Avery was calling Teresa to come over to the house to look at his car to sell? How did they know that? Did they tap his phone? And then they found out, oh my goodness, Stephen's coming over. Okay, so then, amazingly enough, she ends up disappearing and ends up murdered and burnt up. Oh, I guess it's the police. Yeah, they planted all this evidence on him because they were just so ticked off because he was suing, suing the police. Well, let me tell you something. Police detectives and police on, I know, just working cases, don't care about getting sued because they're not the ones getting sued. It's the it's, it's above them. It's, it's, it comes from the government. They don't, they don't lose any money. They're not going to go in on a huge conspiracy. Now, here's another stupid conspiracy. To frame Stephen Avery, they could give a crap, you know, about Stephen Avery or the stupid lawsuit. Anyway, the third party suspect. Oh, wait a minute. Let me, uh, what? Okay. The third party suspect is identified as one of Avery's nephews in the Dassey family. 
not the nephew that was convicted. Another nephew? What is this? A nephew like like pick a nephew? <laughs> Action Two News is not publishing the name at this time, as no criminal charges have been filed. Probably because there's no evidence. To support this. That's why the police do not want to file criminal charges against somebody who's totally innocent. All right. Halbach was murdered October 31st. She had visited Avery Salvage Yard mm -hmm, in Mishakot to photograph vehicles for a magazine. Halbach was reported missing, and then her RAV RAV4 was found at the Avery Salvage Yard because the dude's stupid enough not to get the car off of his salvage yard, but just cover it with a bunch of tree limbs. Investigators found bone fragments in the burn pit on the property because you know when you when you want to frame somebody somehow even though the dude is at home you can you can take her body put it in a burn pit sit there and burn it into absolutely smithereens and never worry about Stephen Avery walking out and go hey dude what you doing in my fur burn pit <laughs> oh my god Zella <laughs> sometimes you just can't you can't make this crap up you know zellner claims the third party suspect killed and mutilated Halbach and planted evidence in her vehicle including avery's blood on the seats and dash and dna on the hood latch okay wait a minute <laughs> it gets worse so now you you know if you think the police were framing avery okay you know at least they have the smarts to do it but some nephew some nephew who suddenly gets decided to be a serial killer um Somehow he's on the property. Somehow he knows she's going to be there. And he goes, oh, lucky me. And so he kills her, plants evidence. In the, so he's going to frame his uncle because he's a really smart dude. You know, he said, by the way, he's a nephew of, of, of let's see, he's a, did they say nephew? Oh, of one of his nephews. So what is he, 20? So he's like the most brilliant serial killer that ever walked. So he knows how to frame his uncle with moving his blood around and the keys around. And he, Selma is getting really desperate. She's given up on the police. Uh, the police framed him. Now she's going on to some unknown nephew framed him. Oh my God. Can't get stupider than this. Zelma, this is going to be, I'm, I suppose it's the next Netflix documentary and, and people are going to eat it up and she's going to make another million. Zellner says the real motive behind the killing of Halbeck was a sexual homicide. You think? That's what you said. That's why Avery killed her, because he's a serial killer. You figured that out? Oh, oh no. But it's not Avery. His nephew is also a serial killer. <laughs> it was a sexual homicide. Not a frame-up of by the police, but a sexual homicide frame-up. Oh, As the third-party suspect was known to view violent pornography. <laughs> this is so bad, I can't believe it. I actually never read the whole article. I'm telling you, I never did. I just saw that she was coming out and talking about this. I had not even read the article yet. It's worse than I thought. The third party suspect was a key witness against Avery at the trial. A forensic examination of the DASI computer found searches for words like DNA and bondage and stab and fire and deleted and recovered pornography depicting the torture and mutilation of young women. Zellner says evidence has been presented that shows a third party suspect was in possession of Teresa Halbach's vehicle and items that were used in the frame up of Mr. Avery. Okay, let's stop here for a second. We were supposed to believe Catherine Zellner when she absolutely said the police were behind the frame up of Stephen Avery. We we're supposed to believe that. Millions of people believe that crap. They've been, they've been harassing the devil out of Wisconsin. Hey, you know, you, you, the police framed him. And all of a sudden she says the police didn't frame him. It was his nephew that framed him. You know, they always say if somebody lies once, don't believe the next lie. Well, this is absolutely outrageous. Oh my gosh. Okay. The motion says the new evidence shows that the Halbach vehicle was returned to Avery salvage yard from a different location which says Zellner says was corroborated by a witness who saw a vehicle similar to Hobox leave the salvage yard and head toward Highway 147 between 3.30 p.m. and 4 p.m. on the date of the murder. The witness <laughs> observed the third party suspect and another man pushing. Okay, now it's not just one dude. It's not a serial killer, but he's got a buddy. It's a pair of serial killers pushing the 
the RAV4 down Avery Road, which in directly intersects. Now they're pushing it because they can't drive it. Because okay. The newly discovered evidence that the third-party suspect was in possession of Ms. Halbach's vehicle. There's no evidence. He made up some crap that he had an opportunity and access to plant evidence in the vehicle and from the vehicle. The motion states that there is a reasonable inference that he planted bones in the Avery burn pit. That, oh my God. It's just, just so bad. I can't believe this is, this is, Zellner should be, she should just lose, lose her life. Well, she shouldn't be able to practice as a lawyer anymore because she, she's, unbelievably follows absolutely i don't know how much lawyers have to follow any kind of rules anymore but hey come on in. zellner is also claiming a brady violation because a call to dispatch from a witness claiming to see the vehicle leave the property was not provided to previous counsel blah 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 okay what else does she say oh my god wow oh okay that's that seems to be it so buckle up, Catherine Zellner says to her followers. Oh, good God. I think she might be a psychopath too. I'm not a psychologist and I, or a psychiatrist and I cannot provide pro, uh, actual um, mental health labeling. But, oh Lord, oh, unbelievable. I, I, let's see, is there another movie coming out? Because I wouldn't be surprised that Netflix is coming out with Unbelievable. Okay. Unbelievable. That's way worse than I thought it was. I, I really hadn't read the whole article. <laughs> I can't believe it. Holy crap. All right. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> um, let's. Annika says, I can't help but wonder how many women weren't raped or murdered while he was wrongfully imprisoned. <laughs> Very good. Uh, yes. Um, as I point out over and over with the Stephen Avery case, he was wrongly convicted in the, in, in the first crime um, because the woman identified him and because the police already knew he was a sexual psychopath and she identified him. They thought it was him. He looked just like the dude who really did it. He was wrongfully convicted. But, you know, when you're investigating cases and you've got a number of people who could have done it, the problem is sometimes if all the evidence looks like it's that guy you get the wrong one doesn't mean he's not a serial killer it just means you got him for the wrong crime so yes he he, he was wrong so wrongfully convicted he got out and then he was rightfully convicted because the dude is a serial killer and and had he been on the loose and who knows even what he's done prior to getting uh convicted of the second crime we don't actually know whether he actually committed other crimes and i i believe you know i mean well well wait a minute i'm sorry he wasn't out. I got this wrong. He was in prison long enough. And when he got out, he didn't have the time. And so as soon as he got out of prison, he had the time to then commit new crimes. If he hadn't been convicted of the Teresa Halbach crime, yes, I think he would have gone on and committed a lot more. So he is a serial killer. Um, and one of the things I always point out about serial killers is just because you haven't linked them to two or three crimes, doesn't mean they're not serial killers. It just means you haven't linked them or they haven't had the opportunity to commit those crimes. So let's say he hadn't, he hadn't gotten commit, uh, convicted of the first crime that he didn't commit. He would have probably committed sexual homicides up until Teresa Halbach um, because he would have been out and available. Um, because he got convicted of the wrongly convicted, he was in prison, so he could not commit crimes. As soon as he got out, there he was committing a sexual homicide. And luckily he got caught for that or he would continue on. So serial killers are serial killers regardless of how many crimes you've got them connected to or how many crimes they have an opportunity to commit. Uh, I've, I fought over the FBI with this for the longest time because they always said you had to have three. Three, three linked crimes before you could call them a serial killer. And I'm like, that's just, just silly because if you have a woman who has been uh, sexually assaulted a complete stranger sexually assaults and murders a woman. He's a serial killer, whether you've proven he's done anything else or not. Just you know, you just need one. But okay, push push it. The, 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 two. But why do you have to wait for three? You got a guy who can, you got two linked crimes of two women who were raped and murdered, and you, you say you still can't call it a serial killer. Well, eventually, 
eventually the, the FBI did change it from three to two. Uh, and, you know, they said, okay, two. I still say one as long as it looks like a stranger sexual homicide. You're looking for what I call a suspected serial killer. Not a proven serial killer, but a suspected serial killer. And that helps you because then you look for other crimes. Uh, and by the way, uh, the one the, the show I just did on Darlene Krashuk, Michael White was convicted of the crime of the, the sexual homicide of, of uh, Darlene Krashuk, 31 years after the fact. But they have never linked him with any other rapes or sexual homicides. I don't believe for a minute that at 26 years old, he just popped up one night, committed one of the most horrific sexual homicides I've ever seen, never having committed any crime before, and then never committing any crime after. I don't believe it for a minute. So either they haven't found what he's linked to or he's the wrong guy, although DNA does seem to connect him. But it's one of those two. So just cra just craziness. Um, what is he? Oh. Annika says, silly cops always planting bones in the fire pit. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is so unlikely and so ridiculous. And it's also just as ridiculous that his own nephew carries a body onto his property. What? That's a lot of balls. You know what I mean? Carry the body onto the property, put it in a fire pit, light it up, and then stand there. Because, you know, the body is going to take a long time. The retire, I believe the retire is put on top. And it took a really long time for, to disintegrate that body to the level it was disintegrated to, burned, burned to very little left in the ashes. That guy had to stand out there for a darn long time. And he's like, what is he going to wave it out there? Ha, ha, uncle. <laughs> don't, don't mind me. I'm, I'm roasting marshmallows out here. Don't come out. Most of marshmallows. <laughs> ah, just, just, just craziness. Absolute craziness. Um, so anyway, that's that one I wanted to talk about. Um, I wanted to mention uh, Christine Smart um, because Christine Smart, the trial is going on right now. Uh, she was, um, Christine Smart was the very beautiful, let me find my picture, Christine. She's very, very, very pretty girl. Um, she was um, presumed to have been abducted, raped, and murdered at the end of her freshman year on the campus of California Polytechnic State University. All right. So what happened was this. All right. So on the 25th of 1996, she attended a off-campus party. Approximately 2 a.m., she was found passed out on a neighbor's lawn. And, and, I, and I say this over and over. You know, um, and this is not blaming the victim. I'm just trying to save future victims. Um, when, when you drink to the point where you cannot control what you do and where you are, and you're found lying on somebody's lawn, first of all, your friends have deserted you. So, you know, you're left there available for, for mayhem. And it's, it's just, don't do that. Be, don't, don't drink that much and stay with your buddies. Anyway, she was found passed out on a neighbor's lawn and two students began to help her walk to her dorm room. A third student named Paul Flores joined the group and due to the proximity of his dorm to smarts, Flores told the other two students he would get Kristen home safely. All right. They assumed that he was another student. He would, who, you know, they were, they were going this way and for he was, his dorm was right next to hers. They thought, okay, and he's a dude. He can hold her up better. So they didn't think anything of it. So he walked, walked her toward her dorm. All right. And she was never seen again. All right. So then they did searches, could never find any trace of her. They never have found any trace of her. And one of the claims he made was, I don't believe he said he actually got her to the dorm. I believe he said he left her at a certain like crossroads. Um, I'm like, and this is used by, I don't know how many guys have made this claim who have killed people. They'll always say, oh, I just left her at this place. Whatever time of night it was, I left her at the crossroads. So she was going to walk in by herself. In other words, giving him a chance for somebody else to grab her before she gets to her dorm or apartment or wherever. So anyway, that's what he said. Um, so so let's say, so what happened was, I, th I think the police are suspicious of him, but nothing ever came of it. And now what's happened is there's now a trial and she was declared legally dead on 2002. Um, so then when did they, when did they get, when did they get him? Um, search warrant was finally served in 2020. 
on the hall of Paul Flores in San Pedro, California. Uh, it's reported that items of interest were found during the search. Among the items found in the search were date rape drugs and homemade videos showing Flores sodomizing and raping young women. I'm very curious about that. Um, that you know, I mean, the question is, who are these women? Um, and, and, and in the trial, I haven't seen anything about that yet because um, there, the, there's no video of him doing that to to Kristen Smart. So who is he attacking? And are these women coming forward to saying, yeah, I went to a party with him or I went to his house and he drugged me and I don't know what happened after that. I, I haven't seen any information on that. Um, they said he found they found date, date rape drugs. I don't know what that means either. On 2021, he had been arrested by he was arrested by the LAPD um, on suspicious of being a felon in possession of a firearm, which is a felony. Okay, and then they had a search warrant to his daddy's home, Ruben Flores, including the use of cadaver dogs and ground penetrating penetrating radar. Uh, so they eventually said that they concluded that Paul Flores attempted to rape Smart. Um, and the statute of limitations is, is done on the rape, which I I have always that's always bothered me. Um, I mean, if they have proof it's a rape and they are real proof that it happened, I don't know why I don't know why they can't have forever on that. But anyway, they don't. Um, but that the murder committed in the course of rape or attempt to rape is justified first degree felony murder charges. So in other words, you can't charge them for the rape, but you can charge them for the murder in the commission of a rape. So. That's our legal system. Okay. So, all right. So then in uh, September 2021, a judge ruled there was sufficient evidence of guilt for the case to proceed to trial. And now it is in trial. Um, basically, what they've said is that they have some cadaver dog hits on, um, I believe, on his uh, his apartment with some, some mattress. After, In other words, after he... After uh, he moved out of the apartment or the, or the dorm, they ch they went in and ch checked the dorm out, and then supposedly there was also the concept that he was she was buried on his dad's property at his house, um, and then moved later on, and the dogs and some other uh, stuff checking out the 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 dirt in the grounds showed human remains. Um, So it's a little, a little bit vague at the moment, as in my opinion. I haven't, I haven't watched the entire case proceed, but it reminds me of Joran von der Sloot. It really does, you know. So Joran goes and he takes, the, you know, Natalie Holloway to the beach. I think he killed her right on the beach because I think she struggled against him. He killed her in the commission of a crime, in the commission of a rape. I think the same thing seems to have happened with Paul Flores. Okay, then. What do you do when you got a dead girl? Call daddy. You know, daddy, I don't know what happened. You know, we were just having sex and she she killed, she, she, she died. You know, I don't know what happened. She rolled over on her face. She put her face on a pillow or face in the sand. You know, I don't know, but you know, daddy, I didn't do it. I didn't mean to hurt her. You know, she, she was doing, she was so drunk and everything. I didn't realize she couldn't breathe properly. So I tell daddy this story. Daddy says, okay, I'll help you out. So daddy comes and helps you out gets hides the body gets rid of the body whatever he does with the body and so now they've also charged the father um do i think he probably did it and daddy helped yes i do i think i'm pretty sure of it but in a court of law what they've got is a little sketchy i don't know how good the the no the, the cadaver dog thing we know that with madeline mccann case everybody down well, not everybody. Half of the people who believe Madeleine McCann was abducted downplay the dog evidence at the hip behind the sofa and at the car and a whole bunch of other places um, and say the dogs are just crazy. Um, and in this case, I'm sure the defense is saying, will downplay this as well. Um, and then you have the information they got from the, the father's home where she was buried, supposedly, under a deck or something. And they'll say this is this is this is quack science. They'll get some experts in who will say this is probably nonsense. It's not very valid. And the jury is going to sit there going, oh, I don't know. Do we believe dogs? You know, do we believe the science? I don't know. And do we have anything that actually proves that he committed the crime? We don't have a body. We got he's got some tapes, but are the tapes 
I mean, porn is not something you can convict somebody on. No. And they had a date rape drug. Well, a lot of people have what is considered date rape drugs. They use it themselves. So that's not very good either. Uh, is there proof that he, these videos of him supposedly uh, attacking unconscious women, sexually assaulting unconscious women, those will be really good for proving it was uh, a methodology of his if they can prove those tapes match somebody. Um, the other stuff, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if they've got enough to convict, I, even though I'm pretty darn sure he did it because last person to see her taking her there, all of a sudden she vanishes. Yeah, like some other guy just popped up and took her and then everything matches you and your daddy. But okay, you know, but I'm, I'm waiting to see. I haven't seen everything in this trial yet, but I was asked to comment on it so that I'm doing so. And I think it's really fascinating. I really do. Um, really interesting stuff. So um, do, do have you seen, has, have any of you seen this particular trial? And do you think that Paul, uh, Paul Flores is guilty as heck? Uh, do you see there's enough evidence? I'm curious what you're going to say about that. Um, because I think it's, it's a fascinating case, but I just don't know if there's enough evidence for the jury to convict considering. Um, and I'm waiting to see what the rest of it is. And on that same note, I want to point out the, the also the very interesting case of, um, uh, uh, Matthew Moore has been accused of killing his wife, Emily Noble. Uh, Emily Noble went missing. Uh, and so what happened there was, uh, he's, Matthew Moore says, you know, I, I went to, we went, we went out for the evening. We went, came home. Uh, we went to sleep. I got up in the night. I went to the bathroom and I didn't want to go back and disturb her in the bed. So I went to, I slept on the couch and when I woke up in the morning about 10 a.m., um, she wasn't there, but her purse was there and her phone was there. And I waited to see where she was and she never came back. It took four months and they found her um, hanging by a uh, USB cord uh, from a tree branch in, in, a, in, in a wooded area near, near the house. And the police believe it was a staged suicide, that she did not commit suicide, that Matthew Moore killed her in the home and then took her out there or took her out there and killed her, one of the two. So um, I, you're welcome. And I, I will address this further if I when I get more information on it, Carrie, but I did want to bring it up because uh, it's very interesting, but I'm just waiting for the fine to hear what all the evidence is and see what, what happens with it. Um, so... So Matthew Moore, let me show you who these, these folks are. Um, uh, this is, uh, hold on a second. Um, where's Matthew? Mm -mm. Uh, is this the couple? Oh, wrong one. Sorry. I'm going to do that in the next. <laughs> that was a request. So it's coming up. Okay, here they are. Here it is. Matthew Moore and his wife, Emily Noble. All right. So let me talk about little bit about uh, just um, suicides in general. The majority of suicides are suicides. <laughs> the pe people con contact me all the time saying my loved one didn't commit suicide, they were murdered. And almost always it's not true. Almost always it truly is a suicide. Suicides are rarely staged. They rarely are. Um, but I have run into a couple, which I, one I absolutely know was staged. Um, another one, which I think Two, which I think were probably staged. Very unusual. Um, but in this case, one of the things that I find unique is that, and I've only seen this in one other, one other case, is that generally speaking, people do not wander into the woods to commit suicide. Um, theoretically, they could do that because it won't be disturbed, but it's pretty rare. Um, and I have to also say, use, using cord, computer cords is also pretty rare. Usually people go with a rope. They'll go with um, uh, a robe tie. They'll just go in the bathroom and hang themselves or go in a closet and hang themselves. I mean, theoretically, she could have woken up in the middle of the night and decided to kill herself off. Or she could have, uh, I don't know, in the morning woke up and decided to kill herself off. But there was no place in the place in the house she could hang herself more conveniently. Um, now she did not do what's called a judicial hanging, which is where you jump off of something like a chair and hang yourself. Um, she did the bend your knee hanging, and a lot of people don't understand how how this works, and that's one reason there's a lot of suspicion about certain hangings. Um, 
So a person will go to the closet, they'll take off their, their um, coat tie and they'll just hang themselves and then they'll just bend their knees. And, and people say, well, that, that must be murder. Well, no, it isn't because if you bend your knees, what happens is eventually you just pass out. It's actually, you know, and so they pass out and then they don't wake back up again. So they pass out, their knees are down. Uh, they don't have to be all the way to the floor, but just it just it constricts the, um, the arteries here. And so what happens is you just kind of go like that and you, you then you can't stand up because you're asleep, essentially. You're, you're unconscious and you can't stand up and then eventually you die. But um, so it's, it's a much, you know, it's much less, much less dramatic than jumping off a chair and, and a le- a much more, so we say, pleasant. Um, this is the, and so what, what happens is people see that, they go, oh, look, they couldn't have died. They've got their, they're standing and like, or they're kneeling or whatever. I'm like, yeah, that's not the way it works. So most of the time it is indeed a suicide. However, rarely do people go out into the woods and do this and take a ISB cord with them. It's just a weird way to do things. Um, there was also an awful lot of fractures to the hyoid bone, and there were some fractures to her face. So this is why the police suspected that Matthew attacked her in the home, maybe punched her in the face, strangled her with his hands, and then said, oh, my goodness, what do I do? I've got to... Uh, wife is kind of dead and decided because they had his own son had committed suicide in a recent past also by hanging in the woods apparently so i think i got that straight um so what happens with people is a lot of times they say either there's two possibilities one is the wife could have said i'm remembering my son doing this and i want to do it too or the father saying i remember my son doing this i can stage this to look like she did it too so she was very, very thin. And he, he points this out in one of the articles um, about his, I mean, sorry, it was a, it was a, he did an interview, which was everybody thought was really weird. She, I'm sorry, that's the wrong person. Wait, 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 sorry, wrong person. Where is she? Where'd she go to? I'm going to talk about that too. Where'd she go? Dang it all. Sorry. <laughs> oh, here she is. Everything's out of order because I ran into all that technical problems. Look how thin she is. She's a little girl. She was 100 pounds or less. Okay, now look, let's look at him. He's a big enough dude. Okay. She is carryable. Okay, so though she was far, the, kind of far back in this woods area, she's carryable. And the firemen carry. Um, I know she's, if she were already dead, she's harder to carry than if she's alive. But still, big dude, little girl, it's only 100 pounds. If you can take a 100 pound sack of crap and throw it over your shoulder, I'm going to say you can, you can carry her. Did he go into the woods and stage this as a suicide after he killed her? That's what he's on trial for. Uh, I have I, I look at the fractures to her higher bone, and if you're if you're doing the kneeling thing, that doesn't usually happen <laughs> because you're not jumping off a chair, you're not doing you know that doesn't usually happen. So the fractures to the higher bone, the fractures to her face, and the fact that she'd be going out to the woods in the middle of the night killing herself is so weird that I can see why the police have focused on Matthew as um, possibly doing her in. Um, I'm waiting to see the rest of the uh, information that's in the trial um, because that's what everybody's involved in right now. I'm waiting to see what all, what all the facts are, but I certainly see why he's on trial. <laughs> Let me put it that way. And it is extremely unusual for a, a suicide to be staged, but if you accidentally, well, let me put quotes on that. If you accidentally, in other words, you didn't plan to kill your wife, but you did it anyway. And now she's dead and she's laying there and you're like, ah, crap, what do I do? You have, you make choices at that point. You can just drive away and put her in a ditch someplace. You can stage it as a sexual homicide and call the police and say somebody broke in, you know, smashed the window out, that kind of thing. Or what people usually do, whatever is cl- uh, closest in your mind from the past, you imitate. And since his own son committed suicide by hanging that was in his mind so i would say well wait to see what the trial comes up with but i find it a rather fascinating case of maybe this time the suicide actually was staged um let's see uh Let's say uh, Lisa says, Pat, you're so insightful. Actually, there is a forest in Japan where people go to actually commit suicide. Well, that's fascinating. The, and I can't pronounce it, Akogara Hara, Akogara Hara forest, also called the Sea of Trees. 
Interesting. Now, this is a great thing to point out, Lisa. Cultures have different ways of committing homicides and committing suicides. Like Harry Carry is not popular in the United States. <laughs> it's that something is Japanese. Um, so each culture has its ways of doing things. Um, and that's, you know, so we have to respect the cultural aspects to things in the United States. Hanging in the forest is not common. <laughs> so, uh, but that's really interesting, really interesting. Um, uh, Molly says, the Emily Noble case is not too far from me. Her friends strongly suspect him. I have seen that. Um, they do. Uh, I don't know that there was much evidence that she was planning to commit suicide. I mean, one of the things that um, the prosecution brought up in court, which I do not agree with, uh, but I see what they're trying to do is that she had made an, I guess, an appointment, dental appointment or something um, like, like she had plans for the future. And this was supposed to be proof that she wouldn't have commit, killed herself so soon after. I disagree with that because I see an awful lot of people who commit suicide will, you know, they're not, they haven't formulated the final plan. They haven't said, I'm actually going to do it. They keep ruminating over it. It's in the back of their heads. They're thinking, maybe this life isn't worth living. I'm, I'm fed up with everything. And so what happens is they go through the motions of a normal life. And then all of a sudden, they just said, oh, screw it. <laughs> and they kill themselves. And I have a lot of people who call me about the deaths of their children, especially their children, like the teenagers, 20s, um, or sisters and brothers, whatever. Um, and they'll say they wouldn't have done this because I saw them at dinner and they were fine. It's meaningless because people go through the motions before they get to the point where they say, um, I, I can't handle it. And, and a lot of suicides are very, they're very quick to achieve. You know, you don't have to put a lot of effort into it. You need a gun, you need, you know, a, a rope, you need a, a rope, a tie, you need some, you need some medications. Yeah. You know, so in, in an instant, somebody can make a very bad choice um, because they finally said, yeah, that I'm done. So you, you can't really depend on having a suicide note and, uh, you know, they were despondent. You saw them despondent because a lot of people will fake it. They're very despondent, but they'll pretend they're not. Uh, so, yeah. Um, oh, I don't, you're, you're talking to Molly there. Um, uh, and I, I want to say, Lisa, as I also have not wa I've watched little pieces of the court proceedings, but I never have the energy to go through all the court proceedings myself. Um, let's say this. Uh, Annika says, cop Kenneth Brew, I don't know how to pronounce his name, killed his pregnant secret girlfriend like this, only on a car, a staged kneeling suicide. Interesting. I'll have to look that one up, Annika. I've not heard of that one. I have not. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's an interesting case. We'll have to see how it all pans out. Uh, but I'm not sure at this point where it's going to go. Um, now, uh, let's see. I have... I want, I'm going to get to, I was asked to do, to talk a little bit about um, uh, Robert Knapper. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to mention um, a couple things. Um, oh, yeah, because someone, I, I have two, three requests. So I'm going to do this, this one first because it's the simplest one. And then I'll get to the other ones. Okay, this is it. Um, this is the case of Randall Ray. Uh, it says here, Hope. Hope they burn. Family is outraged over man's horrific police beating in Arkansas. Okay, so there's a there is a video going around. You can see it on Twitter and elsewhere, where it looks like the the three the three police officers are are brutalizing this guy, especially the guy on the left with a beard. Um, he punches. Looks like it looks like I'm just gonna say looks like he punched the guy in the head a few times and whacked his head into the ground. Okay. Having said that, let me explain what they're outraged about and. I was asked, what do you think about this case? Is it is it police brutality? What's going on? Okay, the family of a man seen in a, vi a video being beatily brutal by a trio of Arkansas police officers. Okay, I want to stop right there. That's not true. He was not seen being brutally beaten by three police officers. Two of the One of the police officers, the one in the middle, was just holding the dude down. That's all he was doing. He didn't beat him at all. The other guy on the end, you see him like using his knee and whacking the guy in the legs. That's a technique because the guy's not cooperating. They're trying to, he's trying to hit like a nurse. They, they, they stop doing that. He is actually not doing anything questionable either. It's the guy who supposedly punches the guy and then whacks his head into the ground. That's the one that actually is questionable. 
So I don't like it again when we, we have things that are just simply not true. And when you're trying to con control somebody who is out of control, one of the problems when you when you when you uh, have a uh, you say all of them are involved. That's not true because you got three dudes who show up at the scene. This guy's going quack, crackers. You try to control him. If one guy gets out of control and does something more than he should, it doesn't mean the other two guys are complicit in that. And that really bugs me when they do that to police officers, which is why we have so few people joining the police force anymore because they'd be crazy these days to join the police force, which is why crime is out of control. Okay, so anyway, the family is furious over the incident. Mind you, they're not furious over the fact that the guy who got beat is a piece of garbage. But hey, you know. I hope they burn Eric Wedding, the stepfather of 27-year-old Randall Ray, told the Daily Beast. The case should be highlighted by the media. Enough is enough. All right. All right. Wed Wed Wedding, a U U.S. Air Force veteran, said he raised, uh, I don't know how you pronounce this guy's name, Randall Ray. It said, it's, I don't know if it's pronounced British style Worcester or Worcester. I don't know. Um, from the age of three. Sees him as his own son. Well, you didn't do a good job because your son is a piece of crap. Sorry. I'm not saying he deserves to be beaten, but your son's a piece of crap. Okay. On Sunday morning, a, vi a witness uh, captured shocking footage of him being beaten, violently arrested, violently arrested. Okay. Not beaten, violently arrested outside a convenience store. All right. So somebody took this video and said, oh my God, look what's happening. Okay. Um, all right. So. One of them is seen striking, repeatedly striking the guy with his knee. That, that I say, is a technique. The first officer grabs this guy by the hair, raises his head off the ground, and slams his skull into the concrete pavement. That does look appear to be what it looks like. I'm only going to hold off a little bit on that because sometimes if you're holding a guy and he re rears up it can, and you're trying to put him back down, it can look like you're beating his head into the pavement. So I, there has to be a lot of examination to be sure that he picked up the guy's head and smashed it, or the guy picked up his own head and then he tried to put him back down. So I don't know there. Okay. Um, so then the cops were identified um, and so they were suspended court pending an investigation, which is normal. And the, the one who is the one who did the, um, let's see, which one was it? Uh, So he, uh, I guess the guy with the head thing, uh, he's, he's on um, administrative leave. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm trying to get his name straight. Worcester, I'm not sure that's how you pronounce his name. Well, bonded out Monday morning, afternoon, uh, from the local Crawford County lockup. According to booking records, he is charged with, among other things, second degree battery, first degree assault, resisting arrest, refusal to submit, criminal trespass, criminal mischief, and terroristic threatening in the second degree. Okay. Now you wonder why is he being charged with all these things when all that happened was he's being beaten by police officers because that's not exactly, we never see what happened right before. The incident began when police were called to a convenience store Sunday morning in Alma, Arkansas, where an employee claimed this guy had spat on them and threatened to cut off their face. Crawford County Sheriff Jimmy DeMonte said that this guy appeared to be in mental distress according to the witnesses then left the scene on a bicycle, ultimately getting stopped outside of another location. After a, com quotes, common civil conversation between a shoeless Worcester, I don't really wish I knew how to pronounce this dude's name, Worcester, I'm going to say Worcester, and I don't know if it's the way you pronounce it here in the U.S., a shoeless Worcester and the three officers, DeMonte alleged Worcester then got physical with one of the deputies, which apparently touched off the outsized response. We don't know if it's outsized yet. It just touched off the response. Worcester was then treated at a nearby hospital, released and jailed. Okay, let me point out this. He was treated at a hospital, released and jailed. That means he did not have any kind of severe damage, okay? No broken bones, no concussion, none of this. Not saying the guy wasn't punched on or, or hit. I'm just saying he didn't have, he was released, so and jail. So the police took him there. He got his, you know, what, what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go to the hospital, make sure that there's no damage to the guys, no matter what you're supposed to do that. And then take them to the jail so that you don't get accused of, you know, not giving somebody medical care. Um, so, so at this point they're looking into what happened to the guy. All right. Um, then, well, down here, they say sustained a concussion. 
I, I don't know who says that. Um, and swelling and bruising above his right eye. All right. Um, and they're trying to get the dash cam videos. Um, and the footage, which has not been publicly released yet, Worcester can allegedly be seen becoming irate before he viciously attacked Deputy White by grabbing him by the legs, lift. Oh, oh, sorry, I got this wrong. Okay, hold on. Worcester, or whatever his name is, can allegedly be seen becoming irate before he viciously attacked Deputy White, one of the deputies, by picking him by, up by the legs and slamming him headfirst on the concrete parking lot. White, not the kid, not the guy who they, they arrested. He was the one who had concussion and swelling and bruising above the right eye. Okay, so according to the police, the police officer was attacked by this guy. The guy threatened people in the store. And then when they tried to talk to him because he's having what seemed to be mental problems, the guy attacked the police officer, slamming his head into the pavement, picking him up and slamming him into the pavement. And that's when apparently he got then the action took place where they tried to arrest him, which he was fighting and they were trying to get control. So again, we have a situation where, no, this guy was not a nice guy. This guy was a threat to the community. They called him homeless. Okay. So, so he wasn't working. He wasn't a responsible citizen. He was threatening people in the community and he attacked a police officer. So this is not Mr. Nice guy. Sorry, parents. Um, not Mr. Nice guy. Whether they had, whether the police officers, one of them, because I can't even see that the other two had any, any wrongdoing. If one of the police officers went further than he should trying to contain the guy, then that's something to be taken a look at. But I think we should not jump to conclusions because we actually don't know it's as bad or the way they say it is. So I think we have to hold off until we get the rest of the dash cam stuff and have an analysis of actually what was happening there. Because when you see the guy supposedly punching him, um, you know, that this would be a matter of, is this a proper technique? And what the question is, where is he punching him? How is he punching him? How hard is he punching? Him? You know, is what is happening? I'm not defending it. I'm just saying we have to look at that. And as far as the head on the pavement, you have to absolutely be sure that he lifted up the guy's head and smashed it on the pavement, or the guy lifted his head up and he put it back. Um, I don't know. So, but two of those guys I didn't see doing any wrong. So if it's one guy who's out of control, then he he needs to be uh, um, he needs to. Uh, be held accountable for that. I don't have a problem with that because we don't want bad cops. I mean, there's, there's not a problem with that. Um, we do not need bad cops on the force. Uh, we do not need cops going, uh, police officers going past what they should do. But we also need citizens not to be criminals <laughs> and not to, to attack the police. So let's be reasonable all the way around. You know, I just think sometimes it's uh, people are, some of the stuff that goes public is just dis doing terrible things to our country because right now, do, we can't get people on our police force in my county or the next county or the next county. Baltimore police just said they, they, they're they way understaffed. Well, nobody wants to be a police officer anymore. Good luck, community. The, the murder rate is skyrocketing. The carjackings are skyrocketing. People are ransacking stores because there's no police force anymore. And so you get, you know, I, I, I do believe you have to hold police accountable because you don't want a bad police officer and you don't want them to abuse the public. But when you, when you, a broad brush where all police officers are bad and defund the police, you're going to get this kind of stuff happening to you and you're going to end up with no police at all. And then you whine because uh, suddenly, you know, you, there's no safety. Um, there's, there's, there in, in, in Minneapolis right now, they're, they're, they're the whole, the whole city's failing because people will not go into the city anymore to do, to go to restaurants. I used to live in Minneapolis. I lived there for I, four years. I lived outside of Minneapolis, but I used to go to Minneapolis to a club with restaurants and stuff like I used to like being downtown. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go downtown downtown at all. I will not go downtown. As a matter of fact, in Washington, DC, I'm not too happy about being in Washington, DC downtown anymore either than the last time I was there and I won't get anywhere near Baltimore. So, you know, I just, I'll stay in the suburbs and just go local. And even that's getting a little risky now. So got to be, we got to use our common sense and logic and say, okay, let's be rational. We want to get rid of the bad police officers, but we don't want to get rid of all the police officers because then we're going to be really in trouble. My God, are we going to be in trouble? So anyway, I was asked to look at that one and I have, I, uh, I'm going to do this one. I'm going to talk about um, a napper over there in, in, in the UK. Um, somebody asked me about, oh yeah, there's two things kind of back to back on this. Uh, one was, 
the the problem was um uh uh a guy named Colin oh crap they just knocked me out of that story dang it all I hate it when they do that they let you in you read the story and then you come back to look at it and they lock you out because you didn't pay for it uh, the guy's name was Colin Wendt. I'm not sure. 18 year old student at Ohio University, honor roll student. Uh, he decided to join the Sigma Pi fraternity and he died during hazing. Oh, Lord. It, it's such a sad story. But one of the things, the question is should we outlaw hazing? Should people be charged for hazing? The student should they be charged because they did stuff to this guy. He went there and they like, if you if you want to be part of our fraternity, you've got to like get up in the middle of the night and run to the store for us. And you got to do all these humiliating things. That's step one. Then there was a time where they beat him with like like um, like whipped him with belts and stuff. That's part two. And then finally, it was like, you know, you drink too. You know, give, we give you stuff. You have to drink like a massive amount of alcohol. And then you or t do some. I think you also did some. some uh, what do you call that stuff? Because uh, I just um, let me let me find out where this is because I. They knocked my thing off here. He died from, well, let's see. What did he actually die from? I think it was some, uh, he breathed in, uh, he breathed in uh, nitrous oxide from a canister uh, known as Whippet. It's a Whippet. Um, and then he died and they're all like, oh, look, he's on the floor. And, you know, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do. They call ambulance because, you know, we're going to be in trouble. And then he died. So, uh, nobody was charged with the hazing incident. And uh, the question is, should they be charged with a hazing incident? <sighs> I do not understand for the life of me why a college, which is supposed to be a respectable uh, institution of education, has this kind of garbage going on at all. I just don't. I, I, this is one of the things I'm fed up with. I just have, just get rid of all sororities and fraternities. Just get rid of them all. Have people go to school to learn. Stop playing these social games. Um, and why did this kid get involved? Well, you know, it's interesting because in high school, he, was, he seemed to be popular and had a girlfriend. His family seems to be very much into um, uh, all the kind of activities that go on in high school, where, you know, rah, rah, rah type of thing. Popularity becomes a big issue for people. And so if you're not, if you want to be popular and you go to a college, this is your college life. It's not about the education. It's about the college life. It's a college experience. It's being one of the one of the people. And then, oh, yeah, I'm part of this, this for this fraternity. I'm part of this sorority. And so I'm willing to do pretty much anything. Humili humiliate myself, grovel, be tortured, and possibly die to get you all to like me, to get to be an included person in this nonsense. Um, and I find that really sad because one of the things you ought to tell your kid is you don't do anything that people, if people are literally abusing you and asking you to do things that are inappropriate, you don't want to be with those people. Why would you want to be in an abusive relationship, whether it be with a boyfriend or girlfriend or in a marriage or with your fraternity brothers or sorority sisters? Why do you want to be in an abusive relationship? I mean, I don't want to tell your kids, don't be around people like that. In high school, you shouldn't be around people like that. In college, you shouldn't be around people like that. What What in you, what What have you taught your children that they should be willing to get, be so low in self-esteem that they have to have the approval of these pieces of garbage so they feel good about themselves? I, I don't know. I don't get it. I, I, I don't, you know, I was an unpopular high school kid, so I, I, I got used to it. <laughs> and I was like, you know. If you don't, if you can't treat me like a decent person, I'm good with not being your friend. I'm good with not being in a group. I'll, I'll move on, you know. Um, and I spent my life being that way and and saying, you know, I, I'm I, I'm happy to be people's friends, but treat me treat me properly, and I'll treat you properly. But when you start groveling for people, okay, I'm willing to be humiliated. What? Will I be hurt by them? Willing to do things that are embarrassing just so you can be their friend? Who is what? Where is the parenting in this? What's going on here? What? Why is nobody speaking up? Why is the college not speaking up? Why are they not eliminating all these horrible, horrible fraternities and sororities? The minute they know hazing is going on, that, that should be the end of it. I don't, I don't get it. Why would you allow abuse within your 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 uh, college? And matter of fact, why do you allow the drinking that goes on in the colleges? I, I I don't understand our entire university system. I think it's a, 
It's appalling. It really is. Um, I go with the, I believe that Mexico has a system and I totally believe in it. Um, what they have there is you go, it actually is free like high school, but you go to the local college, kind of like a community college, but four years and you live at home. There are no dormitories. You live at home. You go to school to learn. That's it. Um, and yes, are there some private universities? Apparently there are, but everybody can get an education by staying at home with their parents. Um, and I, I, I just don't understand this incredible, costly universities people go to to then join fraternities. And we have it right here. University of Maryland is near me. And, it, and I see the whole fraternity sorority row and it makes me want to throw up. So yeah. <laughs> I, I have no love for any of that crap or encouraging your child to ever join one of those things. I'm sorry. Yes, some of them supposedly are wonderful fraternities and sororities and they'll help you in life because they'll raise you up with a group of people that will then be able to get into government and get into big companies and all that kind of stuff. Okay. If that fraternity or sorority has high standards for proper behavior and decency, I'm okay with it. If they don't have those standards and they're into hazing and they're into drinking, your child shouldn't be there and should pull your child right out of the university if they join. Huh. It's one of those things again. I don't have any. I don't have any time for lizard people. I don't have any time for the sickness of these kind of sororities and fraternities, and I just don't. So anyway, that's that's my soapbox for tonight on that. <laughs> All right, <laughs> just really pisses me off because I'm sure that young man had had a future ahead of him, and and he he sucked up to these pieces of garbage, and 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 got killed for it. You know, and do I think they should be held accountable? Hell yeah, I do. Because, but not nobody's holding colleges accountable. They, they should hold the administration accountable. They should just all resign if this happens on their damn campus. Ugh, just annoys me the heck. Um, oh, wait a minute, I don't know what this one is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, this is, um, let's see. Oh, wait a minute, I want to go back here. Uh, Christine says, I won't go to downtown Minneapolis either. Isn't that sad? Yeah, uh, Minneapolis police won't stop you for anything. They're like ghosts. Yeah, they, the police are like, yeah, rob, do whatever you want, we're done. I mean, because they can't take a chance on stopping anybody anymore. Um, uh, extra month to renew car tabs. I don't know if anyone will get that joke. Extra <laughs> Okay, Annika, are you going to tell us what the joke is? Okay, extra month to renew car tabs. Because you're afraid to go get go to the location to get your car renewed? I don't know. Is that it? I'm not sure. Um, Molly says, in the last week in the county where I live, sheriff's deputies have had to shoot and kill two men who shot at a bail bondsman. Three days later, a deputy had to shoot and kill a woman for home invasion. Ugh, what a mess. What a mess. The woman shot at the deputy first with a shotgun. She wasn't allowed at the home as her kids lived there, and she could not see them. Huh. Good Lord. That's even in the room. Oh, Lord. You know, I mean, there's always going to be whack jobs. And the police, knowing they when they join the police force, they know they're going to have to take a risk with criminals and people who are mentally not stable. Um, and I have, I have family members who are law enforcement. But, but when the the community turns against you and the legal system turns against you and the politicians turn against you and you no longer have their support, you cannot go out and do your job. Um, then you're going to either retire, which is happening, or you're not going to join the police force and you're going to have no police force. And then good luck. Uh, just good luck. Um, the other the other thing was uh, was asked about, uh, not the hazing thing was this other weird thing. And then I'm going to do for my last thing, I'll do the, um, uh, the uh, issue with Robert Knapper, the serial killer in, 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 in the UK. Okay. So uh, one of the questions was, is TikTok really causing Gen Z uh, ticks? Gen Z, uh, the real reason ticks are spreading through TikTok. Okay, this is a really strange story, and I'm not a psychologist, and I'm not a doctor, but just want to, I will address this just because it's really weird. So anyway, I did watch the Australian 60 Minutes uh, because I do have the ability to you know, go over to Australia on my computer, and what it was fascinating. So what they had was, all these um, these teenagers, well, not all these teenagers, there were teenagers on there, females, all females, and they all had these weird tics. Um, 
which they suddenly developed during COVID with the isolation period and apparently spending too much time on TikTok and watching other people with these ticks, ticks that were being shown on, on TikTok. And they definitely had ticks. Um, <laughs> And then they definitely had them. I mean, it's bizarre to watch. It's like they'll hit people. They they swear. Um, they the whistling sound. When a girl was just the prettiest girl, and she said she was just like when she, her eyes would go different places, and then she do whistling like a bird. I mean, really freaky stuff. And uh, the question is, they they is this coming from TikTok like a like a hysteria thing? Um, during, during COVID, and it says, during the pandemic, the use of TikTok exploded with communities emerging around anything from aesthetic, subgener, all, all kinds of crap. Tourette's syndrome and tick content is no exception with the hashtags tick disorder or Tourette's at 416 million and 4.7 billion views, respectively, at the time of writing. Referrals for tick-like behavior rapidly increased, particularly in 12 to 25-year-old girls and young women during the pandemic. And so it's just unbelievable. They've had an explosion of these young girls with these, with these, these you have to go watch these. Um, just go watch, you can put on, just go to YouTube and say uh, the, the tick um, disorders with teens. You can just put that in there and you'll find it. Um, so the question is what's happening? I mean, why would this occur? It, is TikTok actually, causing ticks. <laughs> um, and so the, the belief is, and I, I've tried to look at a number of different psychologists that these, these girls were already previously depressed, already suffering from social anxiety. And some of them had minor tick disorder to begin with, but this exploded into something that they have not seen where they are actually imitating what they see. It's like this, they're taking it into their brains and that's becoming a part of them. Um, and it's ruining their lives. And it's ruining their family's lives. It's, it's, it's horrific. It's actually horrific. And so I don't know what's caused it. Do I think TikTok uh, has contributed to it? I do believe so. Because whatever we eat, we take into our physical being. Whatever we see and hear, we take into our mental being. And so we're not, we develop ourselves through what we intake into our, our ourselves. Um, and so if you watch tremendous amount of violence, you bring violence into your brain. If you watch nothing but porns, like, you know, so violent sex porns, you don't have really good attitude toward women and to romantic love. No, you're into, you know, sadistic stuff instead, because that's what you're bringing in. You're pouring that into your brain. So these girls, apparently during the pandemic, they, a lot of girls were isolated, especially the teen girls. Um, and they spent a tremendous amount of time on TikTok and doing other, seeing these things over and over and over again while they're depressed and isolated and suffering from, um, they weren't very happy, let's put it that way. And then they, they brought this into themselves as maybe part of you know something to be, something different, something whatever. Who knows what their brain did with this? But I, the only thing I can say about this, because I don't know what's actually caused it, uh, but you know they, the fact that Again, these things are allowed in such some massive quantity of this stuff. Where does the responsibility come for society or for the family? And I go back to the family every time. None of your teenagers are watching stuff that you do not permit. Sorry, that's your responsibility. They're under your roof. They don't get to do things under your roof that you do not permit. Um, so they can not have access to the amount of stuff that they're watching if you don't allow it. Um, keep them away from that stuff. And if they start having problems, pull them from social media, period. Get get it away from them. I mean, it, it's weird to me that this concept, you can't survive without doing these things. Uh, when you're raising kids, um, even when I was raising my kids, I had limits on, you know, no, I didn't buy video games for them. I didn't. Um, I had a, a rule on television. It was 30 minutes a day. And, you know, it's like, okay, you can watch it. Or if it's going to be more than that, they had to ask permission. Tell me why this was a good show to watch, why that we should spend our time on it. Um, we spent our time doing games and art. And I was a homeschooling mom. So we homeschooled. Um, we played good games. We played board games. We, uh, 
We read great literature. Uh, we had fun with friends. We did all kinds of cool things. But our time wasn't spent in front of television or in front of the internet. And when I homeschooled my granddaughter over the year and a half that I did it during the, the during COVID, we also weren't spending our time staring at, 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 the, uh, at the computer. I did occasionally use it uh, when I wanted to show something about culture from another country. We liked animals. So we did do some animal videos that showed how animals behaved and all that stuff. But there were purposes to what we did that wasn't just you sitting in a corner watching garbage. Um, uh, so we can make these choices. Uh, but when you, when you allow your teens to have no life outside of the internet, when in your own home, you're not eating together, when you're not going places together, when you're not playing games together. And I do many things like board games. I'm a Scrabble player. I love Scrabble. I play that. So there's things that you can do in your own home and art. You can go places or during the, during COVID, what we did because, because of the isolation issue, First of all, if you have a family of a bunch of kids in the family, you're not isolated. I homeschooled for years. We spent a lot of time as a family. You know, <laughs> you're not totally isolated. You have humans in your life. But when my granddaughter, she was an only child, um, we made it. We made a compact with um, uh, two other families. One family had a, a girl and a boy, and the other one had a girl. And we made a deal that we we three families were going to we were going to be together during COVID. They came, we, we had Thanksgivings together, Christmas together, birthdays together. We went places together. We had, we had picnics together. We did, and then the kids could go and forth, back and forth to each other's houses. So we were like an extended family of three families. And that way my granddaughter got to play with other kids. And we, she, she didn't suffer during COVID because she had a pretty good time. So I'm not saying we all did well during COVID. I didn't like it. I didn't have a great time. Um, I, I was glad my granddaughter was here, but because she gave me some, Thing to do while I was trapped. Um, but, you know, these teenagers that got trapped in their homes and weren't socializing and were left on their own with things like TikTok, I believe that that stress and depression allowed them to, I don't know what went to their brains with this stuff. It's so darn weird. It's really weird. But hey, if your child is acting that way, if they're still on TikTok, it's your fault. Cut them off. Cut them off of that nonsense and, and have them start... You know, when you sit there and you read a great book, I sat there with my granddaughter the other day and we were reading Heidi, um, not the television, not the, not the movie, not Shirley Temple, not the newer one. We sat with the book. It was peaceful and it was quiet. And we sat there and we read about Heidi going up the mountain to see her grandfather. And it was beautiful. And you, in your own brain, you develop, you know, the picture of the Swiss Alps and all that kind of stuff. And it's a brilliant book, by the way. If you've never read the real Heidi book, it's fabulous. Um, but it's peaceful and quiet and it gives your brain a chance to relax and not be um, inundated with, with incoming information, which I think is, can be really, really disastrous. You know, obviously I'm not against YouTube. <laughs> Don't go away. Uh, and I'm not against the internet, but I am, I am, I do believe in using things properly. There are tools and we should use them to benefit our lives and not to harm our lives. And we, with our children, we're the ones who have to make sure that our children aren't being harmed by what they see. Um, so that's just my thoughts on that. Um, now, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is, um, oh, let's see what uh, Florence says. Why join something that's based on excluding others? That's a good question. Whether it's sororities or the debutante system or the tennis club, it's about keeping others out. That is a good point. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty awful if you have to, I, I, I was um, very unsuccessful in high school. I remember there was like the Kietz Club and apparently you had to attend a tea with your mother and then you had to be accepted. That didn't happen. <laughs> that was pretty horrible. I'm like, no, you know, it's different if you're joining like a, a you know, a, a sports team where you have to have some skill level to become part of the team. And you know, that means you should practice to get the skill to be on the team. But you know, some of these things are just kind of creepy. You know what I mean? And, let your kids know they're creepy. Do other do other stuff. Like there's a mean things to do um, as far as school goes and education and travel and you know maybe doing being uh, you know overseas for a month in one of the programs. You know you get it's all kinds of things you can do. You can work in charitable situations. You can work with the church. I don't know. Don't have to join one of those things and 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 humiliate yourself and and drink a massive amount of liquor and, and die. I mean it's just it's just really sad. It's super sad. Um, so the last thing I'm going to talk about here tonight is Napper, because I was asked to talk about good old Napper. Um, 
that is this creature. Um, he's a serial killer from uh, the UK. And um, what's interesting about him, which is why it was brought to my attention, is that, um, let me see if I can find the interesting part about this guy. Um, hold on a second. Okay, let's see. Okay, <laughs> hold on a second. I'm trying to find the one. I found the best one, and I'm hoping it didn't disappear on me. Um, okay, maybe it's this one. Okay, so anyway, this guy, this guy, um, it, the, it it's all hooked up with this this case of. Um, let me see the other girl. Uh, where is she? Where is she? Where is she? Okay, hold on a second. Let me find her. Um, where is she? Hold on a second. I'm, I'm missing. I'm missing things again. Oh, here she is. Okay, there she is. Okay, um, this is a famous case, and this was, um, let me get the name straight here. Uh, this is uh, the, Rachel Nickel, um, and let me put her up again. Rachel Nickel, she was murdered. She was walking in the park with her son, and somebody came and stabbed her like, four dozen times and her son was found laying on top and trying to wake his mommy up. It was a horrifying case. And a napper, this guy was eventually convicted of it, but he wasn't the original one convicted of it. The original one guy convicted of it was, where's, where's this picture gone to? There we, oh, here he is. Uh, that guy. Um, and that is, um, uh, one second. I'm not, I'm, I'm from the U S so these names don't come to me so quickly. Uh, so this is uh, Colin Stagg, and he was originally uh, convicted of killing her and spent years in prison. And he was convicted because of majorly because of a, of a criminal profiler by the name of Paul Britton. And he worked with the police to basically help them. He, he, he said this guy fit his profile and he got a honey trap going with the police. And then they got the guy half confess and then they convicted him without any real evidence, but they convicted him anyway. And then later on, they found out that he didn't do it. At least that's what they believe. He didn't do it. And they believe it was this guy, Napper. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Napper, just because this is just a really interesting story about how did this guy not get to be a major suspect in the nickel case or so many other cases. And this is where you see things fall through the cracks. So anyway, Napper, uh, this guy, let's see, they, the basic problem is lack of following evidence and jumping to conclusions. That's the main issue of it. So anyway, um, let me, let me find out about the background of Napper. Okay. Napper, he was born in 1966 and brought, brought up in Plumstead. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Southeast London. During his first 10 years of life, he witnessed brutal violence meted out by his father, Brian, against his mother, Pauline. Such was the trauma suffered by Napper and his siblings when the, company, the, the couple divorced. All four children were placed in foster care and underwent psychiatric treatment. So really crappy home life. No question about it. It seems Napper suffered more than his siblings. Now, he also may have been psychopathic to begin with, so we don't know that. Undergoing treatment for six years at Maud, Maudsley Hospital. As he reached puberty, he was psychologically damage further when a family friend assaulted him on a camping holiday. He was 12 years old. I don't know about the validity of this. Um, if this person wasn't arrested and convicted, this may be something he said that didn't actually happen. I don't know because I haven't, I haven't done any deep dive into this. I'm just going to point out some of the interesting points about this case. According to his mother, he became introverted, obsessively tidy and reclusive after the assault. He would emerge from his bedroom only to bully his brothers and pry, pry on his sister when she was dressing. Okay, the mother says this happened. So I don't know the, again, the validity. His first recorded criminal offense in 1986 displayed no hints of the horrors to come. He was fined and given a conditional discharge after being found in possession of an air gun. Okay, can't do too much of that. Okay, still living at home with his mother. He confessed that he had raped a woman on Plumstead Common. Pauline, his mother, immediately phoned the local police to let them know but they could find no trace of a rape on the common and pursued the inquiry no further. All right. So they had, they had not looked very hard. Some eight weeks later, 
uh, so, sorry, some eight weeks earlier, a 31-year-old mother reported to the police that she had been raped in her home in front of her children. The intruder entered the home through the rear door armed with a Stanley knife and wearing a mask. So the, one of the problems they had was that her house backed onto the comet and they decided it wasn't, but the woman wasn't attacked on the comet. It was just in her house backed up to the comet. You would think they'd look at the area and say, hey, that's we, well, we need to check the dude out. His own mother called it in. And let me tell you something. This is This is what's so important. Most of the time, serial killers' mothers are the suck-ups. They're the ones. The serial killer uses the mother, lives with her forever. <laughs> Mom's always on his side. And after he gets arrested for 20 murders, she still comes to prison and says, oh, it's my darling baby. I still love you. If his own mother turned him in, that's a big fat hint. <laughs> that's really unusual. Uh, so she was really probably thought this guy is dangerous. And she tried to let the police know that. And that was their fault. They should have taken her seriously. Anyway, police had taken DNA from the woman, which they had, which they had, which had they bothered to interview Napper and take a blood test, they may well have matched it to him. So they had DNA from the scene and didn't even bother to interview this guy, this guy whose mother said he committed this crime. It was after this Napper's mother broke off all contact with him. Again, that's a big hint that she thinks this guy's a psycho. Uh, still in his early 20s, he moved into a bed sit, holding down a string of menial jobs, but using his spare time to strike, to stalk and choose his victims. The rape of 30, the 31-year-old was the first in a string of attacks that became known as the Green Chain Rapes. In the months leading up to the Nickel murder in July of 1992, Napper appeared to step up his attacks. Over a two-month period, three women were assaulted along the Green Chain Walk, two 17-year-old girls in March and on May bank holiday, then uh they, they got attacked by him. Now, a major inquiry was set up after the 1992 attacks. Officers were hunting a perpetrator who showed extreme violence toward his victims, using a knife, and on one, more than one occasion, attacking a woman with her children present. Now, um, you know, I talk about VICAP sometimes. In the United States, they have the FBI VICAP system, and they put in things that, you know, specific uh MOs of the crime or signatures of the crime, things that, you know, are unique, put it in there to see if it matches other ones. And a lot of times it really doesn't go anywhere because most of the time they're not that unique. It's like guy jumps out, strangles a woman, rapes her. Eh, you know, <laughs> that's like hundreds of them, thousands of them. It's rare that you have something very unique. In this case, now it's in the UK, but it's very unique that he's attacking mothers, women with their children nearby. All right. He was Britain with two of them under his nose and nobody noticed. Now this is the, this is the, the, uh, the criminal profiler. And I'm not a fond of him. I have his books. I have a couple of his books and I think he's very much like the FBI profiles in the United States uh, using psychological profiling and getting into the mind of the killer. And it's not really working, <laughs> you know, and then making up stuff that has nothing to do with the actual crimes. In this case, you'll have ran random attacks on women with children nearby with knives. So, I mean, you should be looking at who could, could it be a napper sh surely could be it. If the police were not drawing the threads together, others were attempting to point them out in the right direction and bring napper out of the darkness. In 1992 of all, August, 1992, one of his neighbors in Plumstead rang the police to say he looked like the photo fit of the green chain rapist. Police went to his house, questioned him and asked him to give a blood sample at the local police station. He failed to show up. Big hint. A few days later, another member of the public called the police to say, Bob Knapper <laughs> looked like the rapist. Officers returned to his flat and asked him again to go to the police station and give a blood sample. He failed to turn up. This is twice now. And within a few weeks, he was eliminated from the investigation because at six foot two tall, he did not fit the five foot seven inch description of the rapist. Okay, so we're talking about a five inch difference. OK, uh, well, I'm sorry, that's not five foot. It's seven, seven inches. So it's quite a di difference. Um, I understand this part where the police had issues because, you know, when somebody says somebody's five foot seven, like I'm five foot seven, uh, six foot two is a lot different than five foot seven. It really is. I mean, that's tall compared to me. I mean, I'm looking up for six foot two. My, my son-in-law, I believe, is six foot two, six foot four. But he, I got to look up, you know, um, I got to look at my sons. They're six feet and six foot. I think they're 
I don't know, they might exaggerate, somewhere between five foot 11 and six foot one, I have to look up. So I wouldn't know if a guy is my size, I wouldn't know he's any of my size. So I can understand the police thinking he's not the guy because he's taller, but he's also a guy that wouldn't talk to them, come in, give them blood. And how they eliminated him just on that, that, that's questionable. Supposedly, he actually, he actually tended to walk stooped down, which is why that may be an issue. Um, although I, I sort of see their point in that. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see. Um, so then they also had, um, uh, Napper had diaries, which he's called them terrible things. Um, he, he kept notes on on. on on different, oh, let's see, oh, wait a minute, let me find this here a second. Oh, 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 okay, wait a minute, two months, okay, so two months later in October of 1992, he was flagged by the police again. When he was arrested over suggesting he'd been stalking a civilian employee at the Plumstead Police Station, uh, officers searched his bedsit and found a 22 caliber pistol, 244 rounds of ammunition, two knives, a crossbow, and six crossbow bolts. Police files from the inquiry showed they also found pocket diaries, hand-drawn maps, notes written on the borders of newspapers, and London A to Z. And they had uh, uh, references to restraining somebody, uh, calling women terrible names, uh, showing different areas around Plumstead, which the question is, why Why is he marking these areas? Napper pleaded guilty to possessing a firearm and ammunition. In court, references were made to his disturbed mental state and psychiatric report, saying he was without a doubt an immediate threat to himself and the public. So he got eight week custodial sentence and no further inquiries. So now you have a guy who's been in psychiatric stuff for a really long time. His own mother said he, he said that he raped somebody. He's got all the stuff in his bedsit and he's not a suspect. You got to really question that. So meanwhile, um, Let's see. It goes. It goes on. It's just amazing. His name is in report after report. People keep telling him this guy's this this guy's creepy, and and they're being followed by him and stalked by him, and somehow they really never do anything. Meanwhile, they arrest Colin Stagg for the murder of uh, Rachel Nickel, based on zero information except for this sting that they did, based on a criminal profiler getting in the mind of a killer and saying it's this guy because he 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 walks around that area. And so based on no physical evidence whatsoever, and this one incident that he supposedly has something to do, uh, he, he gets, gets convicted. Um, so um, eventually he was ruled out of the rapes and they're now, uh, oh, so let's wait a minute, hold on a second. Um, so basically the problem was they were focused on Stag instead of looking at Napper, who was a much more of a obvious a psychopathic uh, stalker, creepy dude, that they should have been paying attention to. Um, and meanwhile, then he uh, then he kills another woman um, and, and and her and kills her child too. So um, this is uh, he killed this woman and her child. So anyway, that was an absolutely brutal, horrific attack. Well, it took them six months, but they did finally get his fingerprints from the scene and matched him to to the uh, to, to the crime. So. He finally did get arrested after all that. And uh, DNA tests linked him to the green chain rapes as well. So now they knew they had a serial killer, serial rapist, serial killer. Um, and eventually, Stag, um, uh, eventually they figured out Stag didn't do it and, and, and that Napper did commit the crime. This was later with DNA. Um, I, I haven't quite figured out what the DNA is. It's very, that, I, I've looked all over the place for what the DNA was that got him convicted. They said it. It was a partial DNA, and I, I'm looking for the part that says it eliminated Stag completely, but I can't find that. I just find that it partial the partial DNA matched um, uh, Napper. Well, there's no question Napper is a serial killer. Um, Stag, I don't know about the dude. I mean, he was definitely the definitely the way they the way they brought him down, uh, the way they got him, you know, to be the killer of uh, Rachel. I would say was hideous fake fa false criminal profiling, which is appalling and, and embarrassing because you cannot get into the mind of the killer and do those kind of things and then set this guy up and get him uh, with no physical evidence whatsoever. Uh, so it's pretty appalling. Um, I can't say that Stag couldn't have committed some crimes. I can't say that. Um, I don't know. I just know that they didn't have the proof to 
uh, co convict him of the nickel crime, um, the nickel murder. Um, and eventually they say they have Napper on it, who definitely is a serial killer. Um, so pretty appalling police work uh, of ignoring people right in front of them and going instead with, uh, with a criminal profiler who, it, so quite frankly, he just made up, he made up, this is what the guy would be like. And then they said, oh, that's like this dude. <laughs> I mean, there's the funny thing about criminal profiling when you do that is a lot of times you can match that to anybody in the neighborhood, you know, you really can. And so I totally disagree with that kind of criminal profiling. I think it's nonsense. Um, I believe in crime scene analysis and looking at the, the, the details of the crime scene and they're figuring out what that means as to who committed the crime, not just what kind of guy committed the crime, but things would actually link to a guy that committed the crime. Um, and there's a, a second here, ugly dude. <laughs> Well, that's a that's a good one, ugly dude. Yeah, he was, it was it was not an attractive fellow, that's for sure. That's some people say that's why he had to commit those crimes. But I, I, before I finish, I just want to point out. Um, oh, where is that? Really cool. There was a really cool article, and I've lost it. Ah, I hate it when that happens. Oh, here we go. Oh, I found it. Okay, it's this was from the Scotsman. It's called Character Assassination: How Profilers Got It Wrong. And this is about this is about um, uh, uh, about the Ra Rachel Nichol case. So it said basically that um, psychological profile in the United Kingdom. Oh, hold on a second. Why well, they don't do this to oh, don't do this to me? Hold on a second. Did the Scotsman just do this to me? No. Hold on a second. Okay, I'm going to try again. Don't you tell me I have to... If they put these paywalls up, so what happens is they literally let you watch... They let you read it sometimes one time, and when you come back to look at it, they block the whole thing. Okay, I found it again. Don't block me. Okay, so it says here, which is pretty brutal, actually... Um, Profiling of killers has no real world value, wastes police time and risks bringing the profession of forensic psychology into disrepute. Now, the problem is forensic psychology and criminal profiling should not be married. I mean, that's, there are two different things. Forensic psychology is where you're basically analyzing them in a court and all that stuff. Criminal profiling should not bring in the psycho psychological crap that and I agree with that, but it, it's it's a little confusing. Uh, most of the stories, uh, let's see, wait, 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 hold on a second. Psychological profiling in the United Kingdom was undoubtedly damaged by Britain's involvement in the unfounded pursuit of Colin Stagg for the Wimbledon common murder of Rachel Nichol in 1992. Stagg was among a number of men interviewed by police because he walked his dog on the common and he fitted, he sort of fitted Britain's offender profile. So then that's when they got did the honey trap on him and all that. All right. So now what I think they say, which is very, very true now, because I, I, I am against this kind of profiling. It's the mixing of fiction and its close acquaintance, a self-advertisement that was targeted by profession, pr Professor Jackson and his colleagues and which generated last week's headlines. Their particular target was the best-selling book, Inside the Mind of BTK, the true story behind the 30-year hunt for the notorious Wichita serial killer written by John Douglas, one of the originators of, they put quotes, offender profiling. And if, I, if you know me, I do not approve of the FBI profiling methodology. I do not approve of John Douglas's takes on a lot of things. And he gets inside the mind to the point of ridiculousness, which is completely something you cannot accomplish and which is it's just nonsense and it, it's fictional. It really is fictional. Uh, the true crime work is largely concerned with his part in the apprehension. He never, he never apprehended Dennis Rader. So that's just nonsense. Um, of the notorious American serial killer called Dennis Rader, dubbed BTK by the media. Okay. Um, we use Douglas's own account against him on three grounds. It doesn't work. It's bad science and it's unethical. We weren't writing off all forensic psychiatry. So our critique wasn't quite as reported, but we were definitely attacking the first wave of psychological profiles developed within the FBI and then spread from the United States. We are critical of the lack of science and lack of results. That's correct. The FBI profiling almost never solves anything. <laughs> Despite the PR, it hasn't been very useful. That's true. Our focus was what was on what has been called 
with quotes, embedded profiling in which the profiler leads or thinks he is leading the direction of the police investigation by claiming to get inside the head of the offender. Garbage, absolute garbage. When I work with police, I don't say I can get inside the head of anybody. I don't use any psychological profiling. I don't. What I do is say, looking at the crime scene, I'm looking at these crime scene elements and I'm able to say, for example, and one of the crimes coming up, I'll discuss, the, the, the clutch on the car was, uh, was, was destroyed. Therefore, when the guy stole the car, he wasn't going joyriding. He was going to a location where he needed to get to. Therefore, I went, I said, you want to look in that part of town? Because I believe he went home to see, went home either to his mother's or his girlfriend's or someplace. He, he was going someplace specific. So he would have some connection to that part of town. He wasn't just dumping the car over there. So that there's a purpose for that, that I'm saying this. Um, I'm not getting inside the head of any killer. I'm just looking at logic here. Uh, so Professor Jackson thinks that even allowing for the desire to sell books, which is big when you're going to make millions and become wealthy, the proposition is close to ridiculous. Throughout, throughout the inside the mind of BTK, references are constantly made to the disturbing dreams Douglas had about acts of murder. Dude, stop drinking <laughs> or get psychological help. I've never had dreams ever about murder or serial killers. I don't have those dreams. Um, and the litany of disturbed nights he endures. Really? If you can't do your job professionally and go to sleep at night, you are psychologically not capable. You're kind of like, what's her face in uh, Silence of the Lambs? <laughs> you know, um, he claims... Uh, uh, to the point where he becomes less like a rational investigator and more like a shaman, guided by visions, imaginations, and hallucinations. He claims to have subjected himself to near-death experiences in trying to become the victim and the murderer at the moment of the crime. Get out of here. That's that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Oh, just uh, So this is doubtful methodology that led the FBI. He explores the doubtful methodology that led the FBI to enthuse about offenders psychological profiling, much of it based on interviews with incarcerated serial killers who were asked about their motivations and triggers for their action, which you have to be quite, you have to really question because those guys are psychopaths and they're pathological liars. So they mean just pulling, you know, pulling your leg, you know what I mean? Uh, there was no clear basis on which to distinguish which parts of their account was delusional and which was reality. What was a mockery of the interviewers and what was self-serving in pursuit of prison favors? from better clothing to a reduction in sentence. The lack of methodology rendered much of their classifications and categor categorizations as best speculative. I've said this over and over again. You cannot interview the guys that got caught, not even the guys that didn't get caught, because maybe there's a difference there as well. You're picking out these guys to interview and you're making buddy buddies with them. It makes good TV, but it's not necessarily teaching you about the realities of, of the, the crimes they commit. So anyway, uh, they talk about the Hollywood effect, um, and the FBI attempts to provide specialist services, selling itself to ensure its funding and all that, and it's surely overrating its skills. You know, better believe overstating its skills. Yeah. Um, so this this is obviously they're uh, not happy about um, what what's going on here, and they talk about um, the Bible John case where they think that was that was crap profiling. They talk about Professor Cantor, who mentioned the work of a police surgeon in the mayhem of Jack the Ripper. I don't think it's a police surgeon. Okay. But anyway, that's, that's historical. So I'm not so worried about that. Um, because I also, you know, look at crimes and history and, and, and analyze that, but again, not getting in, not getting inside of the head of the killer, but you know, when it comes down to was Jack the Ripper, a surgeon or a, or a, um, a butcher or neither of the, those two, that's more a case of crime scene and that anal, analyzing crime scene information, not getting inside their heads. There's a, two different things. So anyway, I just thought that was a really interesting comment. And that's where, um, you know, Paul Britton kind of did the John Douglas thing or got, you got Paul Britton over in the UK, you got John Douglas in the US. And I find both of them and their version of uh, criminal profiling to be inaccurate and, um, and unscientific. And so I'm with this guy who pretty much trashes criminal profiling. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, Molly says, um, is there such a thing as a decision chart for suspects? It seems like a big red flag should be placed besides the name of any suspect that refuses to give blood or a DNA sample. Yes. Um, oftentimes in a lot of serial cases, serial killer cases, you find that the guy has been interviewed 
and let go. Now, for example, um, when you take a look at Ted Bundy, unbelievable, but the police did not focus on him. And his own girlfriend, after Lake Sammamish, so some guy in Lake Sammamish in California goes up to women and says, I need help with my boat. And I have this, my arm in a cast, can you help me? And he's driving a gold VW, okay? His own girlfriend calls the police and says, I think it's my boyfriend whose name is Ted, because the guy gave his name. He said, my name is Ted. He said, my boyfriend's name is Ted. He drives a gold VW and he's got material for pl plaster of Paris in the drawer for making casts. And he tried to strangle me once. And the police said, oh, you know, he's a law student. It couldn't be him. <laughs> what? How could you ignore this guy? And of course, he went on to kill lots of women because they ignored him. Um, so a lot of times serial killers are truly, if you look at their, if you look back at when they were interviewed, the killer was interviewed, it was like within the first week. And then they took him and put him off and said, no, well, it's not him. They excluded him. Now, my opinion is you're correct. Um, nobody should ever be taken off the list unless they have an alibi. That means they could not have committed the crime. They were completely out of the country. Uh, they were uh, unconscious in the ICU. Um, they were, the guy who was walking, the uh, guy who did the, uh, committed the crime uh, was walking through the park when he attacked a woman, but the guy's been in a wheelchair for 10 years. I mean, you know, you, you can't take the guy off the list until you prove he could not have done it. Until then, yes, they should have a chart which keeps people on the list, but oftentimes it becomes a matter of opinion and they're tossed off. And so all you need is one detective to decide he doesn't think the guy is the guy and tosses him off. And from that moment on, people stop focusing on him. They focus elsewhere and they're wasting a whole lot of time looking at hundreds of other people when the real guy has already been excluded. So yeah, it's a big problem. Um, Lisa says, uh, thanks for covering this case. I didn't ask for it, but I did live close by at the time and remember the police mistakes very well. Didn't know about the profiler's role. Oh, that, that, that I, I only touched on that. It's, it's a huge, huge thing, which is why books have been written about this case and about Paul Britton's involvement in the honey trap um, of Colin, of Colin Stagg. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. But what happens is in desperate times when, when, when police can't come up with answers and especially before DNA, right? Because, you know, DNA makes it a lot easier, but before that, what happens is you get this horrible crime that happens. You don't know who it is. And you're looking around going, wow, there's thousands of people around here. Who the heck could it be? You know, it's, 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 and then there's a lot of pressure on the police. I mean, you got to catch this guy before he kills again. And if he is one of these guys that kills often, you're in trouble or rapes often, you're in trouble. And so it, it's not easy. So I, I, I give a, the police a break on that. I mean, it's, it's not fair really from outside that we say, oh, why didn't they do this? And why didn't they do that? They are, they are overwhelmed with tips. They're overwhelmed with people calling saying, my husband did it. My brother did it. The guy down the street did it. My, especially my ex-husband did it. You know, <laughs> people pointing this way and that way to the, look what happened with the Delphi case. You know, people are claiming everybody's a suspect in the Delphi case. Only one guy committed the crime, but they got like, People call in and on the internet saying this guy did it and that guy did it. The police are sitting there going, you know, they don't know. Um, and they're trying to follow the evidence. And depending on their training and their skills and how difficult the crime is, they're either more or less successful. <laughs> so um, and Annie says, I have seen the Ted Bundy VW in Pigeon Forge. True crime museum. Oh, yeah, you went to Pigeon Forge. <laughs> so creepy. Yeah, I mean. It, you know, it, it, Ted was an idiot. Uh, whoever says this guy was smart is not telling the truth. I mean, you don't go commit a crime driving your gold v, v, uh, v, uh, v, VW because we're not talking about, let's say, uh, a black Honda. Like everybody has a black Honda, right? You're in a gold VW for God's sakes. I mean, a lot of people own VWs, but, you know, little, little bugs, but not many of them are gold. And then you go, my name is Ted. <laughs> what an idiot. What an absolute idiot. And his girlfriend turned him in. That should have been the end of it. He should have been caught right there. But they had an inex whatever reasons. They might have had a smaller police department, inexperienced police officer, uh, detectives who didn't go through any training, which most don't. And he decided, oh, so her boyfriend's a law student. Law students aren't serial killers. Good Lord. Mm, just uh, unbelievable. Um, but, you know, 
everything is a crapshoot. I mean, it really is. It's a crapshoot from the time the guy commits the crime. It's a crapshoot on how lucky he's going to get that the evidence is, whether he's going to leave evidence or he, that he's able to take the evidence away, whether he gets uh, seen by a witness or he doesn't, whether the rain comes in and washes all the evidence away, whether the body is not found for two years as opposed to being found the next day. Um, there's so many things that impact whether he gets lucky or not. And then after that happens, you get to the police department. It depends on how good the detectives are. You can get an idiot detective, you can get a brilliant detective or somebody in between. And that all makes a big difference too. You know, so there's just so much, you know, involved with whether crimes get solved or don't get solved. Um, so a lot of times I get the police a break on some of the things. Now I've been involved in crimes where I'm appalled and, um, yeah, you know, when I do the case next month after I attend the trial, um, I was pretty pissed at that police department. I was because I gave them the suspect and they didn't go after him. And until last year when they arrested him, well, he was already in prison, but <laughs> then they then they finally charged him. After you already killed somebody, if they had gone after him sooner, they would have gotten it. And there was no reason why they couldn't have gone after him sooner. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't have attacked the girl he attacked um, after he committed the crime, the murder. Uh, and I can't go into it right now because I said I wouldn't uh, go public until after the trial. But I was pretty pissed about that. And I, there's, a few, there's a few times when I've been really upset with the police department. Or not necessarily the entire police department, but maybe one detective who I just thought was an idiot. Um, and, and, you know, maybe they, maybe other people in the police department didn't think, you know, the same way. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, one of my favorite cases, and this actually, interesting enough, has to do with the same police department. Um, but there was a detective who, in that police department, who got a guy to confess to a crime which he did not commit, a murder which he did not commit. The guy went to prison for many years. But the, there was another uh, police detective in that same department who thought that the first detective was wrong. And he went to his department and said, that guy's wrong. And he fought that guy. And eventually he was proven to be correct that the first guy got this guy convicted who didn't do it. And the good detective got the real guy uh, who was the first DNA case in the United States for serial homicide. Um, but the two guys worked in the same police department. You know what I mean? So one guy was an idiot and also I think unethical as hell. And the other guy was a great detective. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that case later after the, after the trial in September, because I don't want to say too much more right now, but uh, fascinating. Um, so, yeah. So a lot of things are crapshoot. And then once, once the guy is actually caught, then it goes to trial and you get another crapshoot with, with the prosecution and the defense and another crapshoot with your civilian jury, which half the time, doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> so that anything goes right is, is a, a, a kind of amazing um, at all. Yeah. Um, Lisa says, reminds me of the Craigslist killer. Nobody believed it. Um, I'm trying to remember that one. I remember the name Craigslist killer. Why can't I remember the crime? Oh, um, nobody believed what? That he was the Craigslist dude? Was that, was that the issue? I don't know. I'm going to look at this one up right now. I remember that one. I haven't looked at one that one in years, um, but I do remember the uh, the name uh, Craig's List Killer. Who was the guy? I'm trying to. Oh, Philip Philip Markov. Oh, a medical student. Wow. Okay. Was he at the? Yeah. Craigslist killer. Well, is that the guy? Is that the guy you're talking about, Markov? Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, I was a med student. Yeah, I mean, the problem is most of the time, most of the time, um, it is not a medical student or a law student or um, uh, uh, what's his name? Okay, I'm going to blank on his name too, um, uh, which I think is the weirdest one of all. Uh I have to get his name again because Russell Williams, the Canadian serial killer, Russell Williams, because he was a colonel in the Canadian Armed Forces who once stood next to Queen Elizabeth. And I mean, when they caught him, they're like, Colonel? <laughs> that was stunning. So normally it's a total loser who has not achieved anything academically or even 
done so great in his uh, professional life or in his work life. He may be married because there's always somebody who'll marry the idiot. You know, he may be married and have kids. That's a that that's that that does happen, especially with your serial killers who like the torture and sadism stuff. They tend to get married. Um, so like Dennis Rader was married. Um, yeah, they get married, uh, but but uh, they rarely achieve a great deal in their life because they can't get along with people that well. They don't have the, the, the tenacity, um, they're distracted. There's all kinds of reasons. So to be, to make it anywhere, yeah, it's, that's fairly unusual. So that's why sometimes police go, oh, come on, it can't be that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Williams is one of the most fascinating cases. Yeah, it's just, that, uh, that one is just so strange. I mean, he's a, I mean, he's all there in his uniform with all his little medals and everything. And you're like, you got to be kidding. <laughs> so I have to do a thing on him one day because he's just, um, what am I? I'm going to be doing a whole series on serial killers, but um, I want to have a specific point for each one of the serial killers as to why I'm talking about them, uh, not just giving their history and their whole their whole story. Other people have done that. So when I talk about serial killers, eventually I'm going to point out the one most interesting point about each one that makes a difference in police investigation, but I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> There's so much to do. I haven't gotten there yet. So anyway, that's it. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff uh, that and mo a lot of this, uh, I hope I got to everything that everybody asked me to do this evening because y'all, y'all came up with all these things. Going, Can you talk about this and that? And I'm like, you know, and some I'd forgotten about from the previous requests. Um, but uh, some really interesting things. And uh <laughs> I still love this. <laughs> yes, he was a cross-dressing uh, colonel. Uh, unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. Uh, you know, um, ju just that he made it so far in life and still was a serial killer. That's very, very unique. So, yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, that is it for now. Um, I'm going to try to do a call in maybe next week. I uh, haven't decided quite what I'm going to do with the call in yet, but I promise you try to do a call in every four weeks. Um, and uh, I haven't decided on my Sunday case yet either. Um, so I don't know. So you'll probably hear about the Sunday case either tomorrow or Friday, which one I'm going to do. Uh, and oh, in case I didn't mention before, if you're new here, please do subscribe to the channel like, share, hit the bell. And also if you want to be with this wonderful group of people in the chat room, click on Patreon and join, support the channel. We definitely need it. <laughs> um, well, you're most welcome, Molly. I was a little crazy in the beginning. Um, I say I came off of all the, uh, uh, when, when you start a show and right before the show, you have massive technical issues. By the time you get to the show, you're like totally discombobulated, you know, it's like, where was I? You know, and yeah, I don't know what went wrong. It was I've never seen it before, but my screen was flashing, the whole screen. It wasn't the computer. It was just the actual video part it was flashing. And I'm like, I've done this show for a year and a half. I've never seen that. So I got hold of StreamYard and we did fix it. So thank God for that. But, you know, things that happen right before the show starts, you're like, <laughs> but I am a lizard person. Just let you know. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> I do love lizards, but I am not, I do not have lizard DNA. Okay. Love lizards, don't have lizard DNA. Now might have been a lizard in my last life. I mean, I feel very iguana-like, you know, but you know, I, I, I do not have the lizard DNA in me this lifetime. So I'm not part of the cabal that is causing, like according to David Ike, um, apparently is controlling like literally everything on our planet. So, um, and as I said to anybody who has been commenting on the David Ike information I put out there, um, go away. If you think David Ike makes sense, go away. Sorry, sorry, go away. You need help. You absolutely need help because his stuff is nonsense, absolute garbage nonsense. And he's a danger to human beings. He's a danger, not because he has some ideas. That's okay. Everybody can say, hey, you know, I kind of believe in reincarnation or I, or I believe in a life after death, or I believe that once upon a time, maybe aliens were came, came to the planet and built the pyramids. Okay. I don't have a problem with this. What I have a problem with is, is when you say you got that information because you are, I, I guess, 
a, you're, you're a guru essentially, but you're also some kind of spiritual being that this information came to you from wherever it came from. And you are telling people the truth. You're giving them the answer. You actually know, not just an just interesting concept, but you know. No, you don't, dude. You don't know you're a psychopath and people shouldn't listen to you. And I, 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 will, I will pull every one of those people. Anybody who talks about Anne Heche being murdered and, and David Icke having anything worthwhile to say, I'm sorry, no tolerance for it. I just don't. I think it's, it's enough. We got to stop paying attention to this garbage. We really do. It's, it's pay attention to things that are, you can at least have some support and evidence for something at least is rational. <laughs> How could anyone think our planet is under control? Ah, well, it's out of control. And, and of course, they, you know, I think they're the point of, there are certainly political entities um, and people who are very powerful that do have control over certain things but not to the extent that they're claiming. <laughs> you know, that's where it goes off the rails. That's where it just goes crazy. Um, everyone go to John Joseph and buy the loafers with the crime scene tape on them. <laughs> yeah, they're cute. Those were very cute. <laughs> Hi, cheated no more and welcome. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi, cheated no more. The avatar stuff is ridiculous. Yeah, it surely is. It's just, oh my God. Uh, it is more appropriate. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I definitely think so. Oh no, I everyone, I think I miss a life. You did, <laughs> but you tried. So that's cool, at least you tried. So <laughs> maybe next time I'll be here Sunday at three o'clock, Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, I'll be here um, unless something comes up. But so three, three o'clock Eastern, I don't know what the show is yet. Oh, Lisa, oh, my love lizard. <laughs> I love lizards too. My cat is always bringing to them to me as presents. Yeah, are they dead presents or live presents? <laughs> mine used to mine used to bring me you know the dead mice and drop it at my feet. And then if it, I didn't appreciate it, then he would crunch on it, eat it, and then throw it up at my feet. So it's like really, <laughs> so <laughs> they'll make you pay if you don't appreciate them enough. You know they will. Oh, all alive so far. That's a, that's impressive. It's a pretty good cat there. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. That's it for tonight. I'm going to go make the dinner I didn't get a chance to make before when all the stuff went downhill. Uh, so I will definitely see you, hopefully, on, on Sunday. And uh, you can always put in a last-minute request since I haven't figured it out yet, which one I'm going to do on Sunday yet. So still time. So, so go for it. And I'll pay attention. Bye. Bye.